Good evening and welcome to the Elk Grove Unified School District's virtual board meeting through the Zoom webinar platform. We thank you for joining us and ask for your patience in advance as we navigate this new platform for conducting school board meetings. Legislative bodies, including school districts, are now permitted to hold board meetings telephonically or by other electronic means because on March 17th, 2020, the governor issued executive order N2920 suspending certain provisions of the California Ralph M. Brown Act. In addition, consistent with the March 19th, 2020, statewide shelter in place order issued by the governor, executive order N3320, the Sacramento County shelter at home orders issued on March 19th, 2020 and April 7th, 2020, and the Center for Disease Control Social Distancing Guidelines, which discourage public gatherings, this board meeting is being conducted via the Zoom webinar platform. We are having our first night of live public comment via Zoom. Please be patient with us. There are a few public comment guidelines I would like to share. Public comments provide an opportunity for members of the public to address the Board of Education in an open meeting. Members of the public are encouraged to address the board concerning any item on the agenda or any item of interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. The board will not take action or discuss any item not appearing on the posted agenda except as authorized by law. We note that the views and comments expressed during public comment are those of the individual speaker and do not necessarily reflect the opinions, beliefs, or positions of the district, the board, or district staff. Tonight, as noted on the board agenda and district's website, all electronic public comments that were submitted to the board through the Google platform will be provided to the board in writing relative to the appropriate agenda item. With our Zoom public comments, in addition, those indicating through the Google platform in advance of this meeting, they would like to speak during public comments using the Zoom platform during the board meeting. Your name will be called upon during the appropriate section of the meeting. At that time, your microphone will be unmuted. Your screen at home, there will be a message asking you to unmute. And once you click or tap to unmute, your microphone will be live and then you will be able to give your public comment. When your turn time is complete and you have finished, your microphone will be muted by the district. You must have the most recent version of the Zoom platform client to make live public comments. If you do not have the latest version, you will not be able to make your live comment. During your comments through the Zoom platform, we will provide a reminder at 30 seconds before the end of your allotted time and a timer will be available on the screen. At the end of your comment time, you will be muted. During public comments, also please be aware of the following. The district believes in an inclusive, welcoming and safe environment for its meetings for all of our community. The board respects each individual's rights to express ideas and opinions. Pursuant to applicable law and board policy, the board will not prohibit public criticism of the board or district. It is an ongoing objective of the district to serve all our students and prepare them to flourish as responsible, ethical, and productive citizens. In preserving this mission, we kindly ask that when making public comment, you refrain from the use of profanity, exercise tolerance of others and their viewpoints, and exemplify model behavior. Please be mindful that district students will be watching. You are encouraged to address the board and the public in a respectful manner, such that all those observing from children to adults are made to feel welcome, safe, and valued. The board will not permit any disturbance or willful interruption of board meetings. Persistent or excessive disruption by any individual or group shall be grounds for the board president to terminate the privilege of addressing the board. We appreciate the public's participation and your assistance in helping the board keep its meetings efficient, effective, and respectful. Please be advised everyone participating via Zoom webinar is muted and all board member votes will be by roll call. Members of the board present tonight are myself, board president Beth Albiani, board clerk Crystal Martina Salir, board member Nancy Cheris Espinoza, board member Carmine Forcina, board member Gina Jamerson, board member Tony Perez, and board member Sean Yang. In addition, today's Zoom webinar meeting is being video recorded and will be available on the district's YouTube channel. Mr. Cerruti has gracefully and thankfully volunteered to lead us in the flag salute tonight. Thank you, Madam President. It is my pleasure. Please stand. Salute and pledge. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarudi. I'd like to start with our high school board representative reports. Mr. Murray. Thank you, President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos. Tonight we have presentations, um, video presentations from Elk Grove High School and Franklin High School. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the capable hands of Mr. Steve Maid. Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Avalos. My name is Madison McDonald, and I am the Senior School Board Representative for Elk Grove High School. Along with being in our ASB program, I also am a member of FFA, as well as I play varsity soccer for Ms. Key. As this year has been nothing short of peculiar with distance learning, our her family has risen to the challenge. Our students here at Elk Grove High School have worked hard in their classes, and as a result, nearly 800 academic awards were earned in the first semester. Besides academic achievements, Elk Grove High School students have started up a new tutoring program that is offered every Tuesday and Thursday for students in need of extra help. As a way of encouraging students to feel comfortable asking for help, members of ASB as well as her staff members volunteer to tutor in all subjects. Hello members of the board. My name is Joshua Gar, and I'm Elk Grove High School's Junior School Board Rep, Junior Campus Culture Commissioner, and Junior Homecoming Commissioner. I am also President of Desi Club at Elk Grove High School. I and bringing our report on student unity. Throughout the duration of Black History Month, our ASB students created infographics to shed light on individual Black individuals throughout history who've had a great impact on our communities as a whole. We also have the talent showcase highlighting our uh, peers' talents and allowing a platform for them to express their individuality. We held a spirit week to get our get people into our Elk Grove High School spirit and celebrate the elections of our senior royalty. We once again had our ASB students design infographics to spread kind, uh, words of positivity and embody the kindness that we show at our school and what our school represents. Our ASB also reached out to ninth grade English language learner students to get them kind of familiarized with what Elk Grove High School stands for and give them a piece of the freshman experience. Seniors pushed forward to show fre our freshmen what Elk Grove High School is all about to ensure that our peers feel a connection to our school despite the troubles of distance learning. The two main things I miss from Elk Grove High School is our homecoming fluffs and the rallies we have and just like the football games after that, I would follow it. So yeah. Looking back at my high school experience, one thing that I have found to be a really fun memory is being a part of the dance team. Rhythmical Madness was probably the greatest reason to why my high school experience was so enjoyable to me. And I'm so happy I decided to join my freshman year. Even though we are not physically on campus this year, Elk Grove High School students continue to represent our school in different activities. Recently, our mock trial team was awarded second best in Sacramento County and first overall in Elk Grove Unified School District. Alex Steenslin was awarded best attorney, Macy Massey Vecchio and Kaylin Meeker won best witnesses, and Ethan Mayoro won team MVP. In our ag program, Elk Grove, F Elk Grove FFA members recently competed in the UC Davis Field Day. In the job interview portion of the field day, Haley Cresmo won third high individual, and Brandon Latronico won fifth high individual. In the speaking contest, Bella Albiani won first high individual and Caitlin Tressler won third high individual. With the Sacramento County Fair quickly approaching, members raising an animal at our school farm <clears throat> dedicate one to two hours each week to cleaning and caring for livestock. Along with the UC Davis Field Day and raising livestock, FFA has recently taken part in the tie blanket donation drive to families in need as well as the peanut butter drive to help prevent hunger in the local youth. With everything going on with the coronavirus, Elk Grove High School has implemented safety protocols for our sports programs. As of right now, we have all sports practicing for the new spring season. 
baseball, basketball, cross country, football, tennis, golf, track, soccer, swim, and whimsical madness are dancing. For each of our sports, our coaches have ensured our, our athletes' safety by sanitizing all equipment, wearing masks at all times, excluding swim, of course, and all sports are divided up into separate pods for safety precautions. Good evening, President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Avalos. My name is Isaiah O, and I'm a senior at Franklin High School. And I'm Karina Payton. I am also a senior at Franklin High School. It's been a few months since we last reported, so we are excited to share what our school has been doing. In terms of academics, our students are currently transitioning into their fourth quarter, which started yesterday. They have been checking out new books and returning old ones. In preparation for the district's plan to instate a concurrent model of learning, students and parents have also selected their preference for going back to school. Additionally, hoping to earn college credit, students have been preparing for their respective advanced placement exams. These exams will be full length and will be both online and in person. To ensure student access, teachers have been working diligently to review course material with test interested students. Specific to our school, seniors have also been applying for the Wild Cat Elite Award. This award was created in the spring of 2005 to recognize Franklin High School seniors for the enormous amount of success that they had over the course of their high school careers. The award recognizes student achievement and success in a variety of areas, including academic, social, artistic, athletic, and more. The Wildcat Elite Award is given at Senior Awards Night and students are recognized again at graduation. It is one of the highest honors a graduate can earn for it embodies the all-around Wildcat. In efforts to connect with our student body during this remote school year, Linker has begun hosting different hangout opportunities for students. These events allow a chance for further connections to be made with students across grade levels while engaging in conversations on shared interest. Friday, March 12th, marked the first hangout for the astrology group. One of our teachers and our PBIS coordinator, Mrs. Kashmir, continues to host Wellness Wednesday hangouts that occur after school on Wednesdays for about an hour allowing students to hang out and converse with peers outside of class. Additionally, one of our amazing counselors, Mr. Autumn Reed, hosts Mindful Mondays every Monday before class begins. Specifically for finals week, a couple of weeks ago, he added a new workshop, Peak Performance During Finals, encouraging students to perform their best in combat stress. In an effort to maintain school spirit through Zoom, ASB hosted a Franklin Friday, where students showcased their Wildcat pride through the classroom. Students were expected to dress up in either spirit wear or Franklin colors. On to athletics. With clearance from the district, Franklin has been able to move forward with sports seasons. A plethora of sports were given the green light to attain clearance cards and begin practices and compete, during, and compete including football, track, swim, baseball, softball, boys and girls soccer, cheerleading, and tennis. In addition to practices beginning, we also restarted our Athletes of the Week recognition. Special congratulations to Marshall Bishop and Jenna Calvert, both in cross country for receiving the first Athletes of the Week award this school year. Our women's tennis, women's golf, baseball, softball, and cross country teams have all had games, matches, or meets in the past few weeks, and we're happy to report the Wildcat athletic teams are off to a great start. Also, just last Saturday, our JV and varsity football teams had their first game of the season, which was held at Franklin High School. It is exciting to see our student athletes getting the chance to compete and represent Franklin in the local community. Good luck to all of our teams as they continue their seasons through this last quarter of the school year. In terms of activities, our school has continued to host engaging virtual events for our students. Our Link Crew program hosted a number of mini events, including a series of quarantine cups where students got together virtually to play online mini, mini games. They have also hosted other events, including a video game tournament, and a COVID kitchen where students could learn to bake something new while on Zoom. In addition to these events, our school has also continued to put on holiday themed contests for our students to participate in. For example, 
Back in December, we had a gingerbread house competition, and more recently in February, we had a Valentine's Day baking contest. Outside of holidays, we have also had trick shot competitions, lip syncs, and art contests, among others. In preparation for graduation, our seniors have also received their caps and gowns through a drive through pickup held right before spring break. Non-seniors have also had an opportunity to take school pictures for the yearbook. President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Avalos, thank you so much for your time and consideration this evening. This school year has been filled with unprecedented challenges, but we hope to have a strong finish. Go Wildcats. Thank you. Always the best part of the board meeting. Next, we'll go on to the resolutions. We have National School Library Week. Ms. Soriano, are there any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Man board, man board, <laughs> Madam Board President Albiani, there are no, mem no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Um, so we have no, no live or written comment. Correct. Okay. I would like to call on Dr. Grewal and Mr. Murray. Thank you, President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos. Tonight, Dr. Grewal and I are here to request approval of resolution number 51 proclaiming April 4th through 10th, 4th through 10th, 2021 as National School Library Week. Annually, National Library Week is celebrated throughout the month of April, and libraries host special events to highlight the unique role libraries play in people's lives. This year's theme is Welcome to Your Library. During the pandemic, library workers continue to exceed their community's demands and adapt resources and services to meet their users' needs during these challenging times. Whether people will visit our libraries in person or virtually, libraries offer endless opportunities to transform lives through education and lifelong learning. Celebrations occurring across the nation during National Library Week include National Library Workers Day, April 6th, National Bookmobile Day, April 7th, and Take Action for Libraries Day, April 8th. Good evening. We ask that special recognition is extended to the Elk Grove Unified School District Libraries during the week of April 4th to 10th. It's essential to continue our acknowledgement of their valuable contributions and recognize all library workers, including librarians, school support staff, and several others who make library services possible for our students. First sponsored in 1958, National Library Week is sponsored by the American Library Association and observed in libraries across the country each April, all types of libraries, school, public, academic, and special participate. Libraries are many things to many people and continue to evolve to meet the needs of the communities that they serve. We're asking the board to approve Resolution 51, National School Library Week. Thank you very much. I'd like to call for a motion to approve resolution number 51, proclaiming April 4th through 10th, 2021 as National School Library Week. So moved, Madam Chair. Second. Moved by Ms. Chair Espinoza, seconded by Mr. Forchina. A roll call vote, Ms. Chair Espinoza. Aye. Mr. Forchina. Aye. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Dr. Martina Salir? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. Thank you, and myself, it's unanimous, thank you. If you could move on, we're going to go to public school month resolution. Ms. Soriano, are there any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no members of the public wishing to speak on this item, either live or in writing. Thank you. Mr. Cerruti, would you please present? Thank you, Madam President, and good evening to all of our board members, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos, and the 120 plus community members and staff that have joined in the meeting. The Board of Education is respectfully requested to approve resolution number 55 that proclaims April 2021 as Public Schools Month in the Elk Grove Unified School District. During the 1920s, the free and accepted Masons of California initiated the annual recognition of the role that public schools play in our communities. Since then, the state of California has designated April as Public Schools Month. During these unprecedented times in particular, we acknowledge the contributions our schools play in ensuring the education, safety, and well-being of our students. The purpose of Public Schools Month is to encourage communities to set aside time to honor our public schools and to enlist the community's continued support for public education. Community members are invited to personally recognize the dedication and commitment of the staff 
at their neighborhood schools. And with that, I respectfully request you give consideration to approval of resolution number 55 that proclaims April 2021 as Public Schools Month in the Elk Grove Unified School District. Thank you. I'd like to call for a motion to approve resolution number 55 that proclaims April 2021 as Public Schools Month in the Elk Grove Unified School District. So moved. Second. I have a first by Mr. Perez, a second by Ms. Jamerson. Roll call vote, Mr. Fortina? Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Dr. Martina Salir? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? Aye. And an I for myself, it's unanimous, thank you. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. So I'm going to need some guidance from our board. We have 35 public comments, eight are on Zoom, 27 are written. Um, the board's direction is to hear them or have them read in the order received. And due to the number of comments, we um, allow 40, um, they are not a basis. I would like to allow 40 minutes for public comment as we have come to do and I need to know if you would like to have a two minute or a three minute public comment. May I please call the roll and just have an answer for a two or a three minute public comment to get through the 35 comments, eight which will be on Zoom and 27 which are written. So Ms. Jamerson, a two or a three minute? Two. Thank you. Dr. Martina Salir? Two minutes. Thank you. Mr. Perez? Two. Thank you. Mr. Yang? Two minutes. Thank you. Ms. Chair Espinoza? Two. Thank you. And Mr. Forchina? Oh, we lost you, Mr. Forchina. I can see your name. Okay. Um, I'm sure you want to hear the public comments. The vote is six and Mr. Fortuna is off screen. I will check in and see if I can find them. Okay. Um, we're going to go with two minutes. Um, it's already six, six to either, it'll be six or seven in favor of two minutes. So we will go with two minutes. And I want to remind the public, the plan is to do the Zoom platform calls, such as people were here, and then we are moving on to the written form for our total. Ms. Martinez, would you, Martinez Alier, Dr. Martinez Alier, at 30 seconds, would you please unmute yourself and just calmly say 30 more seconds? Yes, I can do that. I can do that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Our technician will be cutting people off at three minutes. And I wanted to remind people at home, when your name is called, please unmute your microphone. We will not start the time till you start to speak. You may then provide your public comment and your microphone will be muted at the end of your time allocation. We kindly ask that when making public comment, you refrain from the use of profanity and exercise tolerance of others and their viewpoints and exemplify model behavior. Madam President, can I say a quick question? Just a clarification. I heard you just say three minutes earlier. It was two. I want to just clarify we're at two minutes, correct? You are. I'm not sure why I said that. Thank you. Okay. okay. You're at two minutes and Dr. Martinez Alir will give a warning at a minute 30 so people have time to wrap up. Um, we would like to start with our Zoom comments, but I would like to get Mr. Fortina back. Um, Mr. Hoffman? And, and Madam Board President Albiani, just for a point of clarification also, would you like me to announce the names of those who are lined up for public comment on Zoom? Okay. Yes, then that would save them the time of introducing themselves. That's fine. That'd be great. I still haven't gotten hold of Mr. Porcina yet. Okay. I'm checking my own phone and I have no messages from him. Okay. Oh, here he is. Okay, Mr. Forchina, can you hear us?
I have you. Okay. okay. You can hear. So we're going to go ahead and start with our, our Zoom comments. Thank you. Okay, so the following individuals have been have requested to make a public comment via Zoom, starting first with Ms. Lorene Pryor, followed by Ms. Karen Chang, then Tracy Del Nero, Justin Liu, Holly Kroll, Jessica Armstrong, Kira Souza, and then Richard Diltz. Hopefully you all can hear me. Can everybody hear me? Oh, yes. perfect. Um, good evening, um, board and uh, Superintendent Hoffman. Um, I'm coming before you today to talk to you about the discipl disproportionate discipline numbers. Um, originally, you all were um, listed as number three in the state back in when I started coming before you. And we started having these conversations of how racism impacts your discipline numbers. To date, based on a new report, the suspending our future, you all are identified now as number one. So I want to know what all you, what will you be doing and what will you be putting into place to address the issues that black children are having in your district specifically? All these performative um, resolutions you all are doing, I mean, I, that might make you all feel good, but for my community whose children are constantly at the brunt in of your discipline, I wanna know how you're going to fix it. I wanna know why um, nobody's addressing the issue over at Laguna High School with the um, white student union terrorizing our black student union students on Instagram. Who's going to look into that? Who's going to put something into place? The students have been before you all, they have contacted their administration and nobody is doing anything. I wanna know who's gonna address that. Additionally, um, it seems to be that this board thinks that the people work for them when it's the reverse. You all work for the people and the people are asking certain things of you. And I don't understand why seconds left. Sorry. to be stonewalled when we're asking for you all to mitigate certain issues. So what I'm going to need is for somebody to get back to me regarding your discipline numbers and how you're going to address that. BYLP has been coming before you at least almost four years with this same thing and we keep getting gaslit. So I need you all to contact me about these discipline numbers and what you plan to do. And I will follow up with an email and I respect, expect a response. Thank you, Ms. Pryor. We can move to the next one. Should be live now. Give the name of the person. Miss Karen Chang. Need to be sure and unmute on your end. Move on from technical difficulties. Okay, can we go to the next person and come back to her, please? Next person should be Tracy Del Nero. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Tracy Del Nero. I am the president of the Laguna Creek um, Band and Auxiliary uh, Booster Club. And I am before you tonight to discuss the um, desperate need to focus on the advancement of all of our children. Um, we have not had the luxury of being able to go stand outside of the state capitol and push for football and cheerleading and all of these things. I am also a licensed physician assistant, have been in both PA clinically and PA in education for over 22 years. I can tell you scientifically, there is absolutely no reason why wind ensemble and band and auxiliary should not be able to be practicing on campus, socially distanced using the PPE that this district has purchased for these children. Um, it is not possible to be passing aerosoled um, viral particles across six feet um, with these children through a tuba or a flute or a horn, especially when utilizing the um, both personal and instrumental PPE that this district has already been provided. These children are losing out. There are seniors losing out on scholarships because they cannot um, provide um, recordings, adequate recordings for their education. And we have 150 students of all levels of financial- 30 seconds. Thank you. Financial backing involved in this program and we are losing them. We are losing them to Zoom. We are losing, they're losing their skill set and their future. And we are so focused on football and basketball. And if they can sweat and spit on each other, then people playing the tuba six feet apart should absolutely be on campus right now, 100% practicing together. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next comment should be from Justin Liu. Okay, after that, can we try to get back to Ms. Chang? Uh, hello, can you hear me? We can, thank you, Mr. Liu. Okay. <clears throat> hello, my name is Justin Liu. I am currently a senior at Florin High School. I'm the drum major and play trumpet for our school's marching band. Band is usually a very social interactive activity. However, due to distance learning, band has changed. There's no form of community, no interaction between players. Students just simply record their part, submit it to Google Classroom, and just move on with their life. Distant learning doesn't do music education any justice. What used to be a class filled with excitement and passion for music is now nothing. I could see in the faces of my peers, if they even have their cameras on, that is. Our band programs have been robbed of our music educations, while others have been able to continue theirs. Many extracurricular activities besides band have opened back up, back up, like soccer, football, wrestling, swim. We students are frustrated and disappointed that despite numerous scientific researches proving that band rehearsals carry less risk in spreading the coronavirus, our district has not made any solid attempts in ensuring the return of our band program. I understand there, that there are concerns regarding the safety of band students returning with wind instruments, but we can still implement precautions to ensure that students can stay safe. Those precautions can be wearing personal protective equipment, such as the use of bell covers, modified masks for playing instruments, and remaining six feet apart during in-person rehearsals. We students have waited long enough for an answer seconds. as to when we can officially return to all activities with our instrumentation. Just six days ago, our band started a petition that called for the resumption of our Elk Grove Unified School District band program. In less than a week, we've gathered over 700 signatures with the participation of members from other schools in the district. The frustration is real and is common among students in our district to the point where students are giving up on band altogether. We just wanna be allowed to play our wind instruments together on campus. Thank you for- Thank you. We'd like to have Ms. Karen Chang, followed by Holly Kroll. And it's not working. Can you hear me now? 
You sound very far away, Ms. Chang, but I can't oh. hear you. Okay, okay. Um, is my audio better now? That's much better. All right. Okay. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Or no, good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Ching, and I am one of the senior drum majors of Florin High School's marching band. And I am here today, just as Justin is, to, to um, address the issue of our return with the, to address our issue with um, the return of our bands. Uh, I am... <laughs> Sorry. Since October of last year, our band programs have been desperately waiting to receive district approval on the return of in-person rehearsals, but it has been nearly six months already. We have about two months before the end of our school year, and as you may already know, during this timeline, various scientific researchers have debunked the concern of woodwind instruments being a factor in spreading the coronavirus. Following that, on so February 19th, Governor Newsom released a memo approving all school programs to resume as long as COVID-19 guidelines were followed. Despite this news, this has, there had been been no public announcement that declares when our band programs can resume our activities. And as of yesterday, March 22nd, band and drumline have been declared as low contact activities, which is a major update that proves our band activities are safer than the various close contact sports that you as a district board have allowed to resume since February. With that said, why has it taken six months for our band programs to resume? You haven't released any information regarding a solid plan to get us students back to in-person rehearsals with all of our instrumentations and members. And on top of that, seeing how other programs along with sports have been approved to resume before us, our music education amongst band students seem to be simply disregarded and made as a last priority. As our district board, this is not only unfair, but it seems to demonstrate a lack of equity and school support for our VAPA programs. We want to know how you will make up for the months of ed music education that we band students have lost. I speak on behalf of all band students in our Elk Grove Unified School District when I request that you immediately comply with state guidelines and allow our bands to play. Thank you. Thank you. Soriana, who do we have next? Sorry, uh, Miss Holly Kroll. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Miss Kroll. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. I'd like to start by thanking you so much for this opportunity to make this request to you. Uh, I'd like to say that this pandemic has obviously put a lot of obstructions on everyone's plans for last year and this year. But a lot of Elk Grove band members and leaders, including myself, feel like some of these obstructions are, just aren't necessary. One of these obstructions is the inability to have in-person band practices. We've been prohibited from gathering despite the fact that musical ensembles can safely gather in a COVID safe, socially distanced manner. As proved by studies from Rollins College, the University of Minnesota College of Science and Engineering and the National Federation of State, State High School Associations, I'm sorry. Uh, in addition, Governor Newsom said on February 19th that the California Department of Public Health will allow school-sponsored programs to resume their gatherings so long as they're safe. These are supposed to take effect February 26th, and we're still waiting a month later to be allowed to return. Band is a school-sponsored program, so why can't we return to in-person practices? In addition, students participating in sports have been allowed to gather in person, and it's unfair that they've been given the permission to do so and we haven't. Contact sports such as basketball and football are far less safe than band programs, where we have a far lower chance of spreading the coronavirus, yet we aren't allowed to gather in person. Many band members, such as myself, feel like this is extremely unequitable, and we feel like we haven't been given the opportunities that others have. I personally have the privilege of being the head drum major at the Pleasant Grove High School Marching Band, and I was looking forward to an amazing year at football games, competitions, and concerts with my bandmates. And I understand that the coronavirus has made this far more difficult, but I feel like these opportunities shouldn't be completely taken away from us. I understand large events being canceled, but some of us just wish for some form of normalcy. I do sincerely hope that the board will consider this request and allow in-person band gatherings to resume. Of course, we'll follow any and all safety protocols and we do recognize that this is a privilege. Thank you. Ms. Serrano, is that, do we have another one? Um, Madam Board President Aldiani, we have two more. Chiara Souza and Rich Diltz. Okay. 
Uh, can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Kiara Souza, and I'm a drum major at Laguna Creek High School and a junior. Uh, first, I would like to take the time to thank everyone for letting me speak and allowing us students to have a voice to communicate how much this means to all of us. Your kindness does not go unseen. When I went into making talking points, I considered what was most important to me. At first, I wanted to keep my emotions out of it and come in with the facts to help convince that woodwind instruments should be allowed to practice together again on campus with proper COVID regulations. After a long time of reflecting and really deciding what was important to me, I decided that the emotional part of this as a student was something that needed to be said. To provide a background of my love of music, I've always done something musical, be it singing or playing one of the eight instruments I've learned and adored. I've always been in love with music. I started band during my seventh grade year, completely unsure of myself and the world around me and ready to give up music for the fear of what the outside world may think. It was brand that brought me out of my shell and got me to continue expressing myself in a creative way. In ninth grade, when my grandfather passed away, it was band that was able to help me see that the pain would become manageable with time. In 10th grade, it was band that re-reminded me of this when my grandmother passed away as well. Band has been the thing that has brought me out of my shell and has given me the opportunities to develop into a strong and independent young woman through the many shared laughs, cries, smiles, and life lessons. Going into the school year, my junior year, fully distance learning was terrifying. But the one thing that kept me going was band and being able to be back with people I love, respect, and have even grown to call my family. I would like to pause before I continue to make it abundantly clear that I have no issues with football. I am more than happy for my peers and that they are able to continue doing what they love with my personal issue is with band and co-curricular activity is seemingly pushed to the wayside and I'm deprived of that same joy. I do not mean this as an attack and I offer my sincerest apologies if it comes off as such. I appreciate all that the board does and I would like to say thank you for letting me have this time. Thank you. Madam Board President Almiani, I was also missing my, my two tech colleagues. Noted Jessica Armstrong is still also in our uh, lineup. So we'll go with Richard Diltz or Rich Diltz, uh, followed by Jessica Armstrong. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, board members and Superintendent Hoffman. I uh, appreciate this chance to speak. These students that you've heard, they have the facts on their side. They are right. The science uh, is proves that the band is safe. We should also be able to return to singing when it cut with masks and distancing and so forth. There's no reason the arts can't continue. And as they've spelled out and as has been cited in lots of different academic studies, the sports that are already going are higher risk. So I want to know why we can't get our music programs uh, back on as well as all the other arts. Uh, you, you know, the district's priorities include uh, the discipline issues that the earlier speaker spoke of, social emotional learning, academic achievement, mental health, and the arts support all of these goals. And yet it seems like the arts have been left pretty much until the end, even though the arts are actually required for graduation. So, you know, sports are not required for graduation, the arts are, and yet the arts seem to have been languishing while we move forward with other things that have more, you know, larger lobbying groups or what have you. So um, I would just like your reassurance that music and the performing arts will be able to begin in class practices and and work um, as soon as school's back on because these kids need this and it's very important and the district needs it. We need, if you're gonna achieve the goals you want, the arts are the number one way to do that. So uh, on top of that, I would also thank really you. like some reassurance. Thank you. I would like some reassurance that when things continue in the fall, that we don't just sort of let things be. The arts are going to need extra to get back up to speed. And um, that's what we need you guys, we need your support for. So please get on this, get the arts back where they belong, help these kids that have been waiting so long and us frustrated parents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dilt. And our final live comment will be from Jessica Armstrong. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Hoffman. I am one of your teachers and a parent of a first grader and a fourth grader. I am asking that you open our schools to the greatest extent possible as quickly as possible. Distance learning is not working for our children in this house. Um, I wish you could see the difference of the attitude of my first grader when he returned to school last week. It was night and day but it was only for two hours. He was devastated when he realized that he had to go back on Zoom in the afternoon and then again the next day. 
We received his report card. In the comments, his teacher stated, though he is a bright student, he struggles to maintain the same level of academic proficiency in an online environment compared to an in-person environment. He struggles to stay motivated. I think that says a lot. My happy-go-lucky child is showing signs of depression. He clearly does not do well in a distance learning setting. I know that in-person learning is highly outweighs the insane schedule that we are currently living. With the astronomical amount of relief funds that was given to EGUSD, I think you can do better now. $229 million was the total number that was given to the district. With those funds, our students deserve the option to go in person with a teacher live, not on Zoom in the classroom. We should not have to wait until June 15th to find out what our instruction is going to be for next week, next year. Thank you. Do what's best for our students now. Open full time to the greatest extent possible, as quickly as possible, with California Department of Public Health highly recommending three feet distancing. I think we can do that safely this year. And I can tell you that my personal students have had an extraordinary, extraordinary experience coming back to in-person learning for the first time. They can't thank me enough. Our students deserve more. Thank you. Thank you. That is our Zoom participants tonight. And now we will read public comment in the order it was received in addition. Yes, Madam Board President. Oops, sorry. The first written comment, um, and I believe these are still for two minutes, correct? Yes, two minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, the first comment comes from John Smith. Given that CDC guide guidance now places recommended student separation in class at three feet, and the fact that teachers will have been vaccinated against COVID-19 by the time class resumes, what excuses is the district hiding behind to continue to abuse our children? The science has always pointed to, this, to students being nearly impervious to COVID, and yet they have been made to suffer the worst over this last year. I'm calling in this on this body to follow the science and the guidance of the CDC and fully reopen schools for five day per week attendance by students distanced at three feet apart in classrooms like the rest of the country has done. Anything less proves malice on the part of the district and the teachers union. In my opinion, that malice, if it continues, should be met with a class action lawsuit on behalf of all parents for the continued failure of this district to educate our children. This district was the first to close, spent the longest uh, without a plan for students to resume online education, has executed online learning in a worst in class manner, and will be one of the last to reopen. You have never followed any science and out, uh, and our children have suffered because of it. You hold contempt for hardworking parents who paid the tax money to fund this institution, and you care little for the well being of the children you are entrusted with. I challenge you to do the right thing and immediately reopen schools to all students for in person learning at five days per week. Thank you. The next comment comes from a parent of a Sims student. I would like to point out that very likely the percentage of kids currently doing the in-person concurrent model is lower than it could potentially be because once again, kids of essential worker parents whom cannot work from home, such as myself, I am a healthcare worker, are getting lost through the cracks. With school being only half day and many of the child care centers closing since the start of the pandemic, for example, the Sims CDI closed, there is no way for children to, of essential worker parents to get picked up only two to four hours from school start and also no way for them to get from school to an available after school child care center. Why has the district not supported after school child care at all for essential worker parents for the past year? And why is there still no bus or transport services? I know for a fact that some districts are still offering bus service for disadvantaged kids of essential workers. The bus takes them from home to a center where they can do their supervised distance learning. 
um, et cetera. Yet EGUSD has offered no such support or resources for this. And what are the plans for fall to ensure that kids of full-time essential workers can return to full full day, five day per week school. This is not about essential workers needing babysitters. This is about kids of essential workers being at a disadvantage and discriminated against for the past year. And even if it was about kids of essential workers needing help for childcare, not financial help, but resources to ensure there is available childcare for them, what is so wrong about that? We need to work to support our families. And in the case of healthcare workers, we need to continue working to keep everyone healthy. This is about supporting everyone in the community and keeping the whole community healthy, not about protecting one subset of people at the expense of others. And the next comment comes from Erica Meredith. I, like many EGUSD parents, would like to know what the plan is for returning to person to in-person learning in the fall, specifically uh, true in-person and not concurrent Zoom in classroom. Not only have other districts already done this across the state, but most local private schools as well as Placer District. Thank you. The next comment comes from Vonda Long. Hello, Elk Grove School Board members. I would like to express the need for our kids to be back in school full time for their mental, social, educational, and physical health. It has been a year for all of us dealing with this pandemic and we are turning the corner on this. Please reopen our schools. Also, what is Elk Grove School District policy on bullying? Because there are so many recent violent incidents against Asians. Will the school be able to protect our kids and preventing these activities happening at schools? Because I have not heard anything from the district or schools addressing the issue or this issue like when Black Lives Matter movement occurred last year. Will the board be addressing this issue? As parents, we are worried about our kids' education and safety as well. Thank you. The next comment is anonymous. This administration is constantly painting a picture that kids are adapting and thriving in a distance learning environment through presentations to this board, through emails, and through newsletters. This is contrary to feedback from parents who are directly seeing the negative impacts, emotional struggles, learning struggles, and social struggles. It's also contrary to the increasing data reported in the news that distance learning is literally killing kids. Although a rosy picture is painted in public and for the media, this administration and likely this board knows the real truth. Kids are beyond their limit with distance learning. They are struggling mightily. They are breaking. They are crumbling. This administration knows all of this because quietly but regularly, they distribute resources around coping with the pandemic, emotional support, and suicide prevention. In the March edition, along uh, with the EGUSD Community Connection, alone the following resources are offered. Parenting during a pandemic, social emotional learning for families, supporting your pre-K through 12th grader at home, CSD's distance learning support and recreation, EGUSD family and community resources website, Kaiser Permanente virtual program, Ghosted. Why all this if everything's going great? Because you know it's not going great. Put the kids ahead of the unions. Stop taking the easy way and do what's right. You went to the front of the line for vaccines. What's the next excuse not to go back? Your dog needs a COVID vaccine before kids can go back to school? Get the kids back in the classroom full time now. Board of Trustees, take back leadership control and stop rubber stamping what's put in front of you. Be the advanced and envy district you claim to be. The next comment is anonymous. It was so pleasing to see our superintendent along with the governor at the press conference discussing school reopening and knowing that the union representatives were able to attend. It's so pleasing because it affirms and further supports this administration and by ex extension, this board is firmly putting union interests ahead of children's interests. The concurrent model continues to be touted as a return to in-person learning, when in fact it's just computer learning where some of the kids are in the same room. There's also an implied message that all kids and grades 
will have the option to return to campus, but in fact, that's not true. There's a constant drumbeat of how great the concurrent model is. However, we all know it's nothing more than an extension of a failed distance learning model currently being deployed. An entire team of makeup artists have been deployed, but the model is still as it is. The union, and reasonably so, demanded priority vaccinations prior to returning to the classroom. However, now that vaccine vaccinations are underway, there are new demands being made for full return. I'm confident that the new demands will be unending. Once one is met, another will be presented with an infinity loop. This board needs to step up and lead by demanding the administration develop a full return plan for the 2021-2022 school year. There is every reasonable expectation that our communities will have achieved herd immunity by then. Don't let the administration wait until the all clear signal is given to begin the full return plan development, sacrificing even more critical time for the kids. Simply put, all of the members of this board say they are putting kids first, but only a a select few are putting those words into action or trying to anyway. Unfortunately, this school year's unsalvageable, take the next step, take the right step, direct the, um, oh, this school year's unsalvageable. Take the next step, take the right step, direct the administration to develop a full return plan to begin July 1st. Mm -hmm. The next comment comes from Ruby McDowell. Support all students. If football can play and practice, the band should receive the same opportunities. The next comment is from Crystal Williams. I'm writing to ask that band be allowed to resume for kids just like many sports have. They have the necessary equipment to play safely. They can social distance and play outside with the better weather now. The kids need hope and something to look forward to. The next comment comes from Yvonne Chabau. As a parent, I am at a loss to why our kids cannot play their instruments yet. Whereas football and other sports, uh, which are contact sports are allowed to practice and play. The kids not having band had really put some, some of them in a funk. This was their social time and they loved all that band is. Please give guidance as to when band can start. My son needs this. The next comment comes from Julia Butts. Please give all students who are choosing to return to school the option of returning five days a week. With the CDC's new guidelines of only three feet being necessary to maintain safety in a classroom, there is no reason that students should not be allowed to return to school every day. Please be an advocate for our students and follow Natomas and Folsom Cordova's lead by getting approval from the county to expedite this action immediately. This next comment comes from Matt Armstrong. In light of the Carlsbad lawsuit, the California Department of Public Health changing their distance requirement from six feet to four feet, then conceded to the three feet required by the judgment. At what point in the coming weeks should we expect cohorts to be eliminated and students to be back in the classroom four to five days per week? Also, the judgment ruled that the age-based staggered return was a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, as age is a protected class and cannot be used as a basis for discrimination. Due to this judgment, when will the staggered start be eliminated and all students be allowed to return to the classroom? Please be advised, or please advise. I look forward to hearing from you within the week. The next comment is anonymous. I'm interested to know when our schools will open for full-time in-person learning five days a week. Many surrounding Sacramento school districts have easily transitioned from distance learning to either a five day a week hybrid to, or a full-time uh, model. They are thriving. Why is Elk Grove Unified School District drying their feet? More recently, both the CDC and the California Department of Health modified their social distancing guidelines for, for schools from six feet to three feet. With this guidance, it would be much easier for EGSD to accommodate students to the greatest extent possible for in-person learning. 
Additionally, EGOSD's concurrent model and lack of transportation makes it impossible for many families to attend school. It creates inequity for working parents and parents with multiple children and school schedules. Working parents cannot take off work to play chauffeur and parents with multiple children can't be at different locations at the same time. Why is it that airlines can pack their planes full without increased spread but EGUSD cannot allow transportation with similar hand washing, masking, and sanitizing precautions. Lastly, this board is increasingly dismissive of the needs of the students and the families they represent. How many children on IEPs and with disabilities suffer because of this school's, school district's closure? How many students struggle with learning loss, poor grades, lack of socialization, and mental health issues? None of these important factors were good enough reasons for EGUSD to open. However, when EGUSD caught wind that they could lose a, a cut of $6.6 .6 in state funding if they did not open, they felt it was finally safe to open their doors. How is it that other school districts cared about students enough to open five days a week without mo monetary motivation? It feels that EGUSD will not listen to science, reason, the pleading of their students, but that they can be bought by unions and politicians. Mm -hmm. I hope this helps the board understand why parents are frustrated and feel as though EGUSD is doing the least amount possible for their students. It's disingenuous and shows that you have other interests and parties that are more important than the education and well being of children. At least now we know it was never about the children. The next comment it comes from Anonymous. I urge the district to truly follow the science and ethical decision making and take action immediately to open all grades to full time in class instruction. The district must avoid further foot dragging catching up to the best available science, particularly given the immense taxpayer resources that have been allocated in order to provide a rapid return to full in person education. The taxpayers are watching and expecting you to meet your obligations fully. Uh, obligations fully open schools and end the woefully inadequate status quo of distance and hybrid learning. As I'm sure you are aware, overwhelming science, science indicates that children need to be back to in person full time education as soon as possible for both their academic and emotional well being. Science also dispels the need for distance distancing measures that prevent this from occurring further with staff offered Vaccinations, there is no reason why full time in person education should not start immediately, particularly given that children of all ages are at infinitesimally, infinitesimally small risk of serious illness. Contrary to Miss Pinkerton's entirely inaccurate remarks to the media, the reasons that parents are keeping their children home is not an indication that online learning is a success. It is an indication that hybrid learning is not workable for families due to childcare transportation and work issues. It is also an indication that the hybrid model has very little to offer for all of the complications and that it, come, uh, that it comes with. For others, it is even worse, it is even a worse indication that families have chosen to disengage from their schools on a large scale, particularly for older students and disadvantaged students. My high school student would like to return to school, but none of her friends are returning and she sees no reason to leave the house to sit in an empty classroom being taught online. My elementary student asked me every day of the pandemic when he, when he can go back to school. Since finding out that he will be going uh -huh. back on different days. Fine. So thank you. Uh, That's our 40 minutes, Ms. Rowe. All right, I'll, date, I'll mark the last one I read and submit the rest to the board. Thank you. The board will receive the rest of the comments in writing, and we will ask staff to follow up with any public comments with the public comments. Um, Excuse me, Madam President. Can we get copies of the staff responses to the people who have uh, called in and written? Yes, we, uh, we often do. I don't think that's a problem. Um, yes. I would like to do the consent agenda and then take a quick comfort break. So, Ms. Serrano, are there any members of the public wishing to speak to items on the consent agenda? Uh, Madam Board President Aliani, there are no 
uh, no members of the public wishing to speak on the consent agenda. Okay. I'd like to call for a motion to approve items one through 24 on the consent agenda. So move. Second. Moved by Mr. Press, seconded by Dr. Martina Salir. Roll call vote. Dr. Martina Salir? Aye. Mr. Press? Aye. Mr. Yang? Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? Aye. Mr. Fortina? Aye. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. And myself. It is unanimous. I will call a five minute break. Um, actually, let's try for a four minute break if we can make that work. And we will return at what is 713. Thank you.
to get back together, please. I'm here. Thank you. Dr. Martinez Salir, do we have you? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Mr. Perez. Mr. Perez. All right, we're good to go. Thank you. You see Mr. Yang? Yeah, uh, he said he's there. Got it, okay. He verbally awesome. confirmed with me. Um, Ms. Soriano, uh, our next item is bargaining units. Ms. Soriano, are there any bargaining unit members wishing to speak? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no bargaining unit members wishing to speak. All right, then we'll go on to our report for the night, our 2021-2022 educational plan development process. We have 13 comments, six Zoom comments, seven written comments, which should um, enter under 40 minutes, no problem. So we can get started with our Zoom comments. Ms. Soriano, who do we have up first? Uh, Mr. Mate, on our comments, details information, and I don't show bargaining units. So I need to take a moment to take a look at the other spreadsheet. We're on reports, not the bargaining unit one. That's what I was, oh, sorry, the reports. Thank you. So four reports on Zoom. We have the six individuals are Becky Crozier. Okay, let's just announce them one by one. That'll be great. Hi, um, thank you for allowing us parents to call in today and, and express our feelings. Um, I, I went through the plan for the 2021-22 school year and I wanted to take this opportunity to say that I'm, I'm concerned when I see things in the plan, things like you know, that there's still a possibility of distance learning um, being a part of the curriculum. Um, you know, we've had now two opportunities to reopen the school, uh, you know, one with a waiver process that wasn't, that route was not taken. And the second time was in October when the red tier was hit and the district decided not to open at that time. And at this point, I'm, I'm, I have, I have a, a ninth grader in high school and I've got a 10 year old with moderate to severe autism. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we are making progress and getting these kids back to the classroom. I know that two days a week is not enough and we need to get back to five days a week. And I understand that at the last board meeting, part of the reason why the concurrent model was being kept was because of the scheduling. And I want to ask the board if you've, if you've you know, ever considered maybe live streaming your classrooms so that you can keep the schedule that you have and still allow families to do distance learning if that's what they feel is best for them. But I know that there are, there are many speaking. families, there are, thank you, there are many families that are are devastated by the loss of the classroom time their children have, have not had this year. Um, and I just want to ask that we now take drastic measures to get these children back in the classroom. They have to be the, the first priority and we have to show them that the students are the first priority, that everybody else has been working, that everyone needs to get back in the classroom. 
Thank you very much. Our next person, Ms. Soriano. The next person um, in the waiting room is from the EGUSD Parent Coalition, Erin Summers. Reset the clock. I can see you on my screen, Ms. Summers. Do you need to, the only thing I know how to help you with is to ask you to unmute on your end. Madam President, there's two Aaron Summers in the room. I will unmute this one and mute the, and ask to unmute the other one. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Thank you, Ms. Summers. Thanks oh, for your thank patience. you. I wasn't getting any notification previously, so I wasn't sure what to do, but you can hear me now? We're, we're in good shape. Please go ahead. Okay, great. All right. So um, the EGUSD Parent Coalition was formed over six months ago with a singular focus to safely reopen our schools for five days a week instruction. In that singular goal, we have identified the need for parent input in a myriad of district-wide issues like inequity in treatment of students, disproportionate discipline, special education service delivery being either absent or underfunded, lack of transportation, lack of childcare support for parents and teachers alike. The list could go on, but instead of making complaints, we will continue to advocate for solutions and offer our own insight to collaborate with the district to address these problems. The challenge is that despite offering that assistance and requesting a subcommittee for months on the district's reopening plans, our request has been met with a confusing grid of different committees, none of which truly offer student, teacher, and parent input. Instead, they continue to only be run and decided upon by district leadership, with most parents being handpicked by the superintendent himself or other key staff. This is not input. This is feedback after the plan is already in motion. That is not what the community wants, nor it is what we are requesting. We request a subcommittee that's inclusive, inclusive of the diverse community that makes up EGUSD, not just hand selected from pre-formed district committees. With the temporary restraining order on the case in San Diego, schools can no longer enforce the January 14th reopening framework. And with aligned public health guidance from the state of California, there are clearly no more excuses to prevent a full reopening. In addition, this week, a letter of 500 plus physicians urged the governor to act on school reopening and the CDPH responded by reducing the recommended amount of spacing in the classroom from six feet to three feet. This means that we can safely get our children who need in-person instruction back in the classroom for five days a week and still provide an option for distance learning. The district needs to follow the guidance and not block our children's constitutional right to an equal education. Thank you, Ms. Summers. Thank you. Madam Board President Albiani, there um, we have in, next in line a Gracie Sarade, but we don't see that name in our participant in our participant list. We see a Luis Sarade. Um, then after that would be Bethany Robertson and Sean. Um, I think Gracie, uh, let's just unmute her and we can confirm that's who it is and move on. Thank you. Hello, I'm here. Hi. I'm Gracie. Gracie. This is so Gracie. Can. can you hear me? I can hear you, and you are Gracie, correct? I am Gracie's mother. She's oh, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay, so I'm reading this for my daughter. Okay. This has been tough for everyone, in school or not. I remember this time last year, I was absolutely certain we'd be back by May. It was so jarring realizing I couldn't see my teachers or classmates again, not even for another couple of months, but for over a year. And worst of all, my passion, theater, being completely canceled. 
It was bad enough that we were sent home two weeks before our opening night, but it's a little strange remembering how fully finished set still sits in the theater for over a year now. I understand that Elk Grove High School has never been a huge supporter of the arts, but I have to admit that it hurt driving past the school and seeing the sports teams practice while we weren't even allowed to meet up in, with masks on and six feet apart. Beyond that, focusing on schoolwork, we have all struggled. I'm not claiming to be a perfect student, but even my friends who have always been A students have been affected. Our grades have gone down and so has our mental health. Teachers reiterate that we need to take breaks and have personal space over our grades and, and personal grace over our grades, but that's difficult to do when we are still expected to complete the same amount of curriculum specifically for AP classes where we still have to be able to learn all the material in order to pass the test in May. 30 seconds. I routine this year, and I honestly don't think that reopening at this point will help. Considering that the model is just learning from Zoom in the classroom. I'd much rather start next August and come full five days a week with the most important part for me would be interacting with the teacher in a normal lesson, rather than just happening to be in a room where, as the teacher hosts another Zoom. Um, and I can speak as a parent. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, we ran out of time. Um, our next person. Our next person should be Bethany Robertson, and we are also hoping to see Christina Marone, or Marone, who was in our lineup but isn't in our participant list. Okay, Bethany is there. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Bethany Robertson, and I'm a member of student leadership at Joseph Kerr Middle School. I want to share with you my personal experience with distant learning and its impact on my friends and classmates. During this period of school lockdowns, I almost lost one of my friends, and not to a virus that already has a very low chance of hurting someone my age, but to suicide. This... This friend felt isolated and overwhelmed after losing their support system normally found at school. In addition to the mental stress and loss of hope, my friends and I have missed out on countless experiences that we will never get back. For the past month, I've been visiting my grandparents in Utah, and I was shocked to learn that in-person schooling is the norm at public schools there. I'm confused why our public schools are not doing the same. School districts like these across the public school, uh, sorry, school districts like these across the country, as well as private schools here in our own country, are modeling how our school district can safely reopen to five day full in person instruction. Please act now to prevent any more needless suffering or worsening of mental health problems and don't let this next year be another wasted experience for my friends and classmates. Open up our schools now to five day full in person instruction. Thank you. Thank you, very well said. And who do we have next? Next would be Sean Mitchell. Hello, board, can you hear? I can hear you, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. I wanna make sure that um, I have both my phone and my computer going so you could hear me. So does that sound good? There's a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure if we need to have both. Whichever one we chose, let's try the other one. Yeah, I just wanna make sure I'm good before I get started. How's that? That sounds perfect. Well, thank you for having me tonight. I really appreciate the telephonic comment tonight. I know how hard you're working, and, and that's uh, not something I want to call out tonight. But I certainly want to uh, make sure I come to you as a father of three children in your district, one in elementary, one in junior high, and one in high school. You know, we this all started in, in, as a parent coalition. I'm a co-founder, and I'm, I'm blessed to be able to serve Aaron. But um, 
with a feeling in our stomach and a trust for you to get us to the place we needed to be in a year later, we're still standing here. And we're having a hard time understanding um, what the issue is. And in January 8th, when we went with, met with Mr. Hoffman, um, nothing has changed. We asked for inclusion and be part of your bargaining agreement uh, and, and to have a group. So we formed a coalition so you could partner with the community. And it's taken us six months to get here to finally have an opportunity to partner with you. A good example of why you would want to do that is the vaccine clinic that you've done. Um, that was generated by the community uh, that you serve. And so you have an amazing amount of resources available to you in the parent community that you're not taking advantage of. And we wanna say that we're still here to collaborate with you, but our patience is wearing thin. Uh, we expect uh, that you're gonna invite us back to the meeting room from this point forward. We know that we have the three foot rule that's in effect. So there's no reason we can't be looked in the eye and, and told what's going on and where we can give public testimony uh, to what is happening. So with only 30 seconds, I will say that uh, we expect to get back to five days a week. We have a problem with page five of your planning assumption where it says students will be provided high quality instruction where the law says that you will provide in-person learning for the California constitution and you may provide distance learning. So we'd ask that you honor our rights. Fulfill Thank you, I'm sorry it cuts you off. Um, I know we are in written communication with you and believe um, our next person. Uh, last call for Christina Marom. Is she not in the room? No. Okay, let's go ahead and go with our written comment and could someone keep an eye out? If she does appear, we could stop and go back to um, hearing her comment verbally. Yes. Thank you. The first written comment comes from Erica Meredith. Uh, CDC and CDPH both say it's safe to go to school full time at a three foot distance with everyone able to get a vaccine over the summer. There's no excuse for anything other than a full return to school in the fall. Kids need full-time in-person instruction. The next comment is anonymous. Uh, it's actually um, duplicate This uh, what I just read. The next comment comes from Marissa. I am worried about what the 2021-2022 school year will look like. The board and EGEA and other labor partners need to welcome all students back full time at the start of the year, whether it is in July or August. It is essential that the next school year is as normal as possible for these kids, some who have been through hell and back over the last 12 months. From what I understand, our teachers want to be fully vaccinated before returning, even though it's not a CDC recommendation for safe in-person schooling. By the time B, C, and D tracks come back in July, every single teacher and staff member in EGUSD will have had the opportunity to receive the vaccine. So put a check mark on that. What other reasons are there for not returning to campus full-time, five days per week? These, those concerns need to be addressed now so that a plan is in place before summer break. Hundreds of families have pulled their kids from EGUSD schools. The district needs these kids back. The risk of delaying your decision on a 2021-2022 plan will lead to even more disenrollments. Doctors and scientists gay agree schools can and should reopen. Students need this. Families need this. Educators need this. Schools are safe. I look forward to seeing EGUSD announce a full five day per week, full time on campus schedule for the 2021-2022 school year. Peace. The next comment comes from Brianna Alexander. EGUSD board, this has went long enough. I have four children still in schools, three in elementary and one in middle school. I have one of I have one of kids who is suffering from lack of assistance and ability for full services. My kinders should have the ability to learn inside the classroom and receive the basics that we parents adults had as students. 
my fifth grader is headed to sixth grade and has limited time in learning in the learning center to help with a full IEP. And now I have to push with no response or generic responses for more assistance as she will be in sixth grade and headed off to middle school before we know it. Still, EGUSD can't figure out how to help our kids and be the, and be the school. Right now, EGUSD is failing our students, our future workforce, and failing even more for our children with disabilities. I expect to hear five full days for 2021-2022 school year and anything else is unacceptable. Uh, the next comment is anonymous. I'm writing to ask the board to open our schools full time, five days a week in person for the 2021-2022 school year. I expect nothing less than this model for the majority of families who have been requesting it for an entire year. Those who are not comfortable with in-person can request virtual academy or another type of online schooling. Five day a week in person should be the norm, not the exception. Transportation for all students is also a must for the upcoming school year. Many families are too far away from their school sites and work in jobs that do not allow them the flexibility to transport their children to and from school. Child care would also need to be available, especially for essential workers. Additionally, I'm asking that the board include parent input in the decision in the decision making process. At the last board meeting, some of the trustees discussed handpicking parents to help them with this process. This will not do. Every parent needs to be included. Every parent and student's input needs to be valued. This past year, neither parent or student input has been valued. It has been asked and allowed because it is sometimes required by law, but it is almost always dismissed. Furthermore, questions to emails and public comments are rarely, if ever, answered. Let us have a seat at the table. This is our children's education. This is our children's future. We should have a say, and our say should be valued just as much, if not more than an organized union or far removed politician. The next comment comes from Karen Mitchell. The EGUSD educational plan for 2021-2022 is already fundamentally flawed in that it includes options yet again for distance learning. Public schools are just that, public. If a small percentage of your student population requests distance learning, then please expand your virtual academy and reroute those students and expedite the education of the remaining students that request in-person instruction five days a week with the CARES Act funds provided. Stop impeding my child's education. My 11-year-old is failing half of her classes due to technology issues and lack of engagement because she is mentally exhausted from your technology overload you disguise as curriculum. If you don't understand how difficult distance learning is, then please try to conduct your board meetings from a Chromebook using a hotspot. We need five days a week in person learning, nothing less. Please follow the science. Uh, the next comment is anonymous. I am a parent of three children enrolled in Elk Grove Unified School District, kindergarten, second grade, and fourth grade. I'm asking that you open schools five days a week for full-time learning. Every day they are forced to con continue the charade of or charade of learning via Zoom is affecting their emotional and social development and well being. My oldest child now sobs through math work daily and ends up crying at least once a week during Zoom when he experiences technical difficulties or falls behind on instructions. My second grader is falling behind academically and her teacher cannot adequately teach her visa Zoom. My kinder has never experienced a day in the classroom. We spend at least 30 minutes a day waiting for children to mute, locate materials, or find a parent. Two days a week in class isn't enough and learning via Zoom in the classroom is just absurd. The options for learning provided by the district are severely lacking. Teachers have now been given the option to get vaccinated. The state has changed the guideline to three feet distance between chairs. Schools all over the US have reopened fully, safely, and without incident. There's really no excuse for you not to provide five full days of learning per week for the children you serve. And that concludes the public comments, Madam Board President. Send their time right into it. Um, 
We're going to call on Mr. Cerruti to give us the report. Thank you, Madam President. And again, good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Avalos, and the entire Elk Grove Unified School District community. Um, Chanel, if you would be so kind, please, if you can pull the presentation up and I will walk uh, folks through that. Um, just before we jump in that a reminder uh, that there are two versions. There is this version and there's a, a more detailed version. Um, and that detailed ver version was provided uh, in particular for our two new members of the board who may not have a historical context uh, for the, the planning that uh, and the strategies that took place about a year ago. Um, and then very specifically uh, last spring as uh, we were concluding the fourth quarter of last year. And it appears we just, there we go, thank you, Chanel. The fourth quarter of last year. Um, and it also helps any of our staff or members of our community who may not have the full historical perspective. This abbreviated version is portions of that. It's not new information, it's portions of it. And it moves us more quickly into uh, what I believe the primary interests are, and that is not looking backwards, but, but looking forwards to our planning for uh, next year. Next slide, please, Chanel. Uh, the presentation, uh, as I mentioned, indicates the structure and processes originally used, and then it also adds information on how we're adjusting that planning based on, uh, particularly in the area of stakeholder engagement, um, and as a result of the changing health conditions and related federal and state reopening guidelines, when to show how quickly in the timing of things and how fluid things are, as we all know, um, it was this, this information was posted um, along with the agenda on Thursday. And on Friday, we received information that the state aligned, um, for example, their social distancing um, with that of the federal government. So um, as you'll see in just a moment, we have been and will continue to be very responsive uh, to the changing health conditions with our interests being providing our kids as much in-class opportunity as we possibly can. Next slide, please, Chanel. Five areas of, of the presentation that I'll provide. Some planning foundations, planning assumptions, stakeholder feedback, not only what we've done, but also what's being planned. And then planning process uh, and team structure, and then a timeline of what we'll be doing in particular over the next uh, month and a half to two months. Next slide, please, Chanel. I won't go through every one of these, uh, every one of these boxes, but when we began our planning process, um, instead of just jumping in, uh, as we were initially shifting our district um, to a full distance learning district uh, in order to do that. We didn't, uh, you'll see in a moment, the team structure that we used and put in place that enabled us to make that shift quickly and successfully and continue to adapt and adjust and respond. We really look at it in, as, a, as responding versus reacting. Um, and just wanted to point out that Maintaining the principles of high quality instruction and multi-tiered systems of support, regardless of the modality, whether it's full distance learning, whether it is a combination of classroom and distance learning, or as we're continuing to move toward bringing more and more of our kids back with the goal being all opportunities to bring all of our students back five days a week in our schools. Um, we, the principles of high quality instruction have remained the same. Um, as has our, our approach with MTSS systems and supporting the whole child. As we looked at it through the lenses of, of equitability, um, main, making sure that flexibility to meet the needs and access was also a strong consideration as, as well as that idea of transformative leadership. Um, this has transformed our district. We will not be the same. We shouldn't be the same. We should continuously improve and we will. The experiences we have gone through um, hearing some of the comments um, that were made this evening al align very closely to this. And I understand that if people see or hear the term distance learning, the concern can be, are we going to continue distance learning um, next year? And 
we will continue, as you see, you'll see in just a second, those planning assumptions to remain in alignment with the health conditions. Uh, but this has transformed. We, we do see our Elk Grove Virtual Academy and uh, the Las Flores Independent Study Programs um, likely expanding. And we are exploring how we can continue to offer distance learning in an expanding manner to those who have found it to be successful while we would be offering um, full, uh, a full return to school if, those, if the health conditions um, allow us to do such. In terms of safety, um, ensuring that we were in alignment with the health conditions, but also ensure in terms of training and protocols. Lots of work has gone in to enable us because even in bringing students back into our schools, for example, as they are now, the protocols in place for social distancing, uh, for sanitation purposes and whatnot, that that training has been for all of our staff and has, uh, has been a strong focus of, of what we've been doing since the outset, our focus on clear communications and in terms of responsiveness, that's what I was just referring to, being timely, proactive, flexible, and very intentional in what it is that we are doing. This has been really the foundation for us in order to make the thoughtful planning decisions that we have during these very difficult times. Next slide, please, Chanel. Thank you. The six planning assumptions, there are four that predominantly we had used up until um, our current situation. And those four remain that will adhere and continue to adhere to the health and safety guidelines, our focus on high quality instruction, and that is whether that be distance learning or combinations as we have with in terms of in person instruction um, in our concurrent model or full return to, to school, we will maintain a focus on high quality instruction and the 12 principles of high quality instruction that we adhere to. Uh, using current research, we use a research firm out at Washington DC, EAB is the, the research firm, and uh, we've continued to rely on that as well as information from a number and variety of sources to inform our decision making. We absolutely will apply lessons learned as we've experienced and continue to gain experience with distance learning, the concurrent model, and we have always um, when we were pre-COVID, were very actively uh, eliciting the responses from our staff, our parents, and our students in terms of what is working for them in the classroom and what we can do to improve services to our kids. And the newer ones are, is the shift from the initial educational planning of, of moving to distance learning in the concurrent model and now we're shifting. And so we're continuing to adjust based on those health conditions. And we're, as a result of that, we're expanding our stakeholder advisory to optimally align to those uh, current planning conditions. So now we're at a point where we are looking to continue to expand. And you'll see in just a moment, some expanded committees um, and opportunities for our, our parents and staff um, and students to become directly involved um, in providing us uh, information and advisory capacity as we're moving forward. Next slide, please, Chanel. So this is showing the informed decision-making. This is providing information in terms of the uh, what we were seeking to gain um, over this past year, which is information specific to instructional experiences, student workload, student engagement in terms of students and parents, levels of satisfaction. We've continued to gain information about reopening preferences and priorities, support needs for teachers and administrators, and then we've gained information on open-ended responses um, related to positive and negative experiences. And all of that is information has significantly guided um, efforts to continuously improve. And in particular, in, with respect to, to uh, training our staff and keeping our teachers related service providers up to date with uh, the most current information they need to provide the best possible services to our students under the conditions that we were able to provide. Next slide, please, Chanel. This shows 
some feedback events that have taken place. I won't go through all of these individually. Uh, this is what we have done. And in just a moment, you'll see what is planned uh, over the next month or so. But everything from initially connectivity and communication back um, nearly a year ago, making sure that everyone was connected and so instruction could continue under a full distance learning model. We received reflection information on distance learning, parent input and preference. And you can see going all the way down to the most recent, which um, is in February and March, looking at, we're currently looking at uh, EGUSD LCAP needs analysis. And the interesting part of this um, is the LCAP process is, it's an opportunity that we engage in typically that starts in September and runs through uh, the middle part of November in terms of gaining information, needs analysis information, opportunities that take place as a school site. We do it at the district level, gather that information so we can make informed budget and programming decisions. And the circumstances needed us to adapt that. So we have been gathering feedback all along for the past year in terms of the services that we've been providing kids in the educational service delivery model. And we're continuing to do that um, in terms of what we're doing right now with a single open-ended question regarding what, what is it that parents and our students and our staff need in order for us to be successful next year. Next slide, please, Chanel. This is a, uh, just one second, please. Thank you. This is this is the a, a schematic of the process that we used last year. Um, I realize it can look um, a lot of committees, and um, the way that this functioned was when we began to move to distance learning, and then actually also a key point in time was about. Um, late April to early May, as we were beginning to look at the end of the traditional school year, the end of the fourth quarter, and we began planning for, for the next school year. And at the time when we were seeing numbers that were moving in the right direction, if, if people recall back in October, we were hoping to bring students back until, um, until the numbers spiked significantly and it didn't enable us to do that. But the strategy that we used was a strategic planning team that had representatives from those tactical and specialized operational teams, as well as leaders from uh, our, all of our labor, labor groups. And just as a reminder, the other version of this, that more detailed version includes membership on all of these committees. And as you'll see, if you look at that more detailed version, there are many, many, many people connected and involved in this work. Um, I just want to point out that while those are independent boxes, they do not function or work independently. Tremendous crossover uh, work and integration into all of these elements that enabled us to be able to pull off converting a district of our size in about a month's time from a traditional school district where kids were in our schools to a full distance learning uh, model. And so now you're going to see what we're going to be adjusting. In the next slide, please, Chanel. So the strategic planning team is shifting to what we're terming an educational model advisory team. And it's going to be expanded. Uh, it's expanded district and site administration, staff, parents, and students. So we're going to be expanding um, all of those groups. Um, and we will be pulling from a variety of different, uh, different groups to be bringing a broader group together. Um, the tactical teams and the specialized operational teams, they'll remain intact. Those are our staff. So for example, if it's we're looking at how we're providing food service, um, folks recall when we were when we first moved a year ago to distance learning, it did not stop us from from, from providing food to our, our kids and families. And so the, those tactical teams and specialized operational teams will remain intact. Um, the professionals will continue to plan and do their work, and then they will be providing updates and they are part of the leaders of those teams are part of the educational model advisory team. So we'll be able to provide updates to folks as well as engage in conversations, hear interests 
um, and just the ongoing health updates in terms of what are the guidelines telling us? Are they continuing, continuing to move and trend in the right direction that will afford us the opportunities to bring students back into our schools at an increased level? And then a new team that we're developing is the parent advisory team. And you can see there are representatives of that group from a variety of, uh, of existing groups that will be uh, pulling folks from. We really will be doing an open all call um, to those so that, uh, and then we'll take a look. Um, if we have 200 people there, these will remain um, at this point in time, uh, virtual meetings. Sometimes the virtual meeting is actually preferred because depending upon when we have them, people don't necessarily need to leave their home to be a part of that. And so uh, as we're beginning to develop what those uh, meetings will look like, and basically they would be structured along the lines of what's the current information we have? What is it that we're currently doing? Based upon that, we want to get feedback from, again, our key constituents in terms of how we can best support our kids and families, both in school, as well as those that do want to remain at home or uh, in any of our, uh, either the virtual academy or Las Flores independent study. And I do want to point out that one of the groups that um, didn't get added there, and that's, that's uh, an omission on my part, it wasn't intentional. We do have a group, uh, Latinas Madres, um, that we will also be pulling, a parent group that we will be uh, pulling some representatives from and offering this as an opportunity as well. Next slide, please, Chanel. This then shows uh, graphically the change. So you can see the educational model advisory team. And you can see that parent advisory team. Um, the next slide, please, Chanel. So this shows what's taking place um, up to the middle of June. And you'll see that there are our meetings, basically those two teams, the educational model, model advisory team and the parent advisory team. We are looking at meetings in uh, April, May, and June, because if you back map from June 15th, um, that's even tight. Hopefully we will know um, what we will be doing and offering in 21-22 uh, prior to that. But school opens uh, July 15th is the first day, um, unless I'm mistaken, that's the first day of our year-round schools opening back up. And so we need at least a month uh, lead time. And I, we only say that because things are changing so quickly. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean in the wrong direction. Um, a big part of our, our meetings when we are together is getting that accurate information and then combining that with the guidance that we are getting from the state and then sharing what it is that we are doing in response to all of that. And based upon that in April and May, and then the feedback that we will be receiving both from those groups, but also we will have feedback both on, both on the concurrent model as well as through the LCAP needs analysis, we will have a wealth of information. Um, the, the one thing that we tip our hat to is the fact that our community does respond to our surveys. And we understand we have surveyed a lot, but it is it can be a very effective way of getting information. And it is thousands. Again, that detailed version of this provides the actual numbers. It is tens of thousands of responses. And we have ways of, of analyzing every single bit of information that we get. And I want to share with the community, we do not, um, we do not just gloss over open-ended ended questions. We analyze every single open-ended ended, ended response that we receive. Next slide, please, Chanel. And I believe this is the last slide. Um, and with that, we believe what we are doing is responding as quickly and swiftly and thoughtfully as we possibly can, given the changing health conditions, with one interest in mind, and that is providing safe, high quality education to all of our kids, supporting our teachers and supporting our families, and we will continue to do that. And with that, Madam President, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, 
the report. So it's a chance for us to give input back to Mr. Sharuti and the team on, um, on what we see here. So we'll start, um, Mr. Perez, you're up. You're, you need to unmute, Mr. Press. I, I can't hear you yet, Mr. Press. Okay. Uh, well, you're there. You're good now. Thanks. Okay. Well, the issue was uh, I couldn't get access to the mute button. <laughs> you needed to um, minimize the, the picture. Anyway, let's start at page one. Oops. Okay. Um, okay, next page. Okay, this is the whole presentation, right? Next page. Okay, here, page, what's this, what, what page is this? That's page four, Mr. Press. Okay, so that's okay. The issue I have, the equity of access expected equity outcomes I think we need to focus a little bit more on that issue in our community and parent engagement and possible regional workshops, presentations in our, our, our um, school board areas of service. Uh, so far um, lately, the, uh, all the feedback from the community, either they're not participating in the surveys or, or or are they are these people who are who are, are are speaking about these issues in our um in our time slot for con uh, comments from the community are they participating what's the issue because you know uh, we so far we have what how many surveys that have we had out there in our community two or three Oh, no, more, more than that. I'd have to go back. I can't give you the exact number, but they are all the, the, the information in these PowerPoints list every single one. So like, for instance, uh, when we do feedback to these individuals that do uh, public comments, are we inviting those individuals to these particular surveys and, and uh, community meetings at their school sites? Or are they aware of that? What's the miscommunication? I think there must be a miscommunication or lack of communication what can we do better well one of the things mr press so um as i've shared with the the board over the past several many years actually since actually the in particular since the inception of the lcap so i lose track of the years that go by very quickly six seven i think it may be even more than that seven eight years um Stakeholder engagement is a is a key component of that, and right. we will never say that we do it perfectly. But right. you know, I, I share the story that what we do is when we initially started this, um, we received uh, about two thousand responses. Um, I have the number nineteen hundred in my head, and I do respectfully ask that nobody hold me exactly to that number. But I'll be in the ballpark about nineteen hundred. And the last time when we did this and we were under normal conditions um, and we went through the LCAP needs analysis process, we were at about 31,000 individual respondents. So significantly more, but we also track them. So we do track them by individual schools um, right. and by regions. And we do know that there are regions that um, making 
particular outreach into the communities uh, and to ensure that we are getting that, that response from an entire community that is reflective of the population in our community is an effort we need to continue. So we've done, we have done things and keeping in mind that at the site level, every one of our schools engages in these processes individually. And then the other thing that we've done specific to this, because it was so crucial that we get information and feedback. Um, and in particular, when we started trying to, to gauge preference of uh, whether or not parents uh, wanted their children to remain in distance learning and return to our schools, we were looking for 100% response rates. So we had phone banks where we were actually reaching out to an excess or approximately 2000 families where we were trying to reach them independently. So we will never have it perfect um, unless we literally get a response from every individual. But um, I am pleased with the progress we are making. Um, and in addition to that, we do have parent groups that we did not have that long ago. So our work through our family and community engagement, the Office of Family and Community Engagement and Office of Educational Equity in particular, have instituted um, and have new um, parent groups, but also community groups where we're expanding our connectivity to our families and community members. So I, I appreciate what you said, and I agree with it, that we need to continue to do it. But I, I do want to point to a definite positive trend that we have had. Right, but the issue, like I've, I spoke in another budget meetings, uh, parent engagement, the lack of what, $200,000 that we have, that's a line item. I think we need to do a lot more to, uh, parent engagement at, and with more funding for you know, throughout our school district. That is compared to other school districts throughout California, that's, that's a shame. You, ought to, you need to research uh, parent engagement at other school districts and, and their funding level at that because that's, that's a very important issue regarding this outreach and information communications to our parents, which we, are, we all heard the comments tonight, either they're not in the loop or, or we're not doing our job. Uh, and I think that the equity of a unit needs to be expanded and the parent engagement unit needs to more resources and funding. I've said this many times. So, you know, then that's a reflection of what's happening with our parent uh, protests is my understanding that you mentioned that's outside our district office. Mr. So, Perez? Okay. Budget okay. process is coming. Okay. Um, can we talk to the plan development process on the agenda, right. sir? Well, any other is. Concerns? This is part of the plan and as a result of the plan, we need to give it some funding stakeholder feedback to date no health educational uh, with page six please page six page six chanel thank you okay. well this here's another issue we do not have i feel that we do not have a good strong health component in this er area stakeholder feedback in informed decision making. Um, yes, uh, the reports that I've seen, we have a good uh, team working with the staff and uh, Elk Grove Teachers Association, but yet we need a good health component dealing with these health issues with our students. Uh, this is what I think it's missing through this, this particular arena here and you, you, further down in the other presentation, we lack a good, uh, and we do meet, and, and the public needs to see that we do meet with the, the county, the county department of health, and we need to get those reports and on our webpage or at the parent meetings that we answer, you know, parent meetings throughout the district that we are working in conjunction at the county level, state and federal level. Now that we have, okay. Satisfaction, yeah, we, apparently there's an issue out there with the satisfaction of what we're doing. So we need to get these people happy, please. Page, page seven. I don't see this, okay. 
Again, uh, I've seen uh, how many parent meetings are here? Parent selection. We have surveys, but like, again, I think we need a, a component where we actually go to high schools throughout our district in those service areas where the middle schools and elementaries, if possible, do more outreach in the communities um, where they, um, where these parents who can't afford to get on the bus or a car or whatever to, you know, walk down the street to the elementary school, you know, PTA meetings or whatever, and give some talks to them, see, you know, tell them what we're doing, updates. Hey, uh, page eight. Again, where does health fall under this umbrella of uh, specialized operation planning team? So, Mr. Perez, if you look under the tactical planning teams, right, and you can you can see lower the 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 second row, second oh, to the okay, left. Okay, okay. Health, health and hygiene, health and hygiene is right there, and and as you indicated, and I would would absolutely support that. Um, Don Ross within in student support and health services and his team, and Tommy uh, Almatari, our district's mm -hmm. health coordinator, mm -hmm. they have. Uh, and all of our health, uh, our, our nurses, our MHTs, our counselors, our psychologists, our social workers, um, they have been in sync um, working to support our, our kids and our families. And, and we are not at all saying that our kids aren't necessarily struggling um, during this time. We acknowledge that and recognize that, but this was a this was a primary focus because it's not only the health and safety there when this started, this was the health and safety of, of the adults. And that's a major shift that right. has taken place is typically in schools under normal conditions, primarily when you're thinking um, health, it is student health. And um, it was a major shift to shift over to include the health and safety of, of the adults and our, our staff. Exactly. Uh, and also adults of these, our student body, uh, that's a big issue. We need to have them as PTA or what do you call it, parent engagement me, uh, meetings that we have to get them involved and 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 talk about the health and safety and uh, and internet engagement, digital divide, educate them. I, that's what I requested before. We need to educate these parents how to engage through the internet and the web and tech, today's technology. You know, not only do our students like it, our parents like it, and also to give them parent education, how to teach, how to tutor their kids. That's a big a thing, a component I feel that we have with through this process. And, and, and Mr. Pratt, Mr. Prez, if I could, you, you mentioned, and I just want to reinforce our Office of Family and Community Engagement. Mm -hmm. um, Again, whether or not we need more, that's all part of the budget development process. But uh, Lisa Lavasser um, is literally nationally renowned um, right. in terms of her knowledge. And we have been able to leverage Title IV for, for funds to be able to expand that office. Mm -hmm. And everything that you just listed, um, those are the types of things that we are reaching out directly to our families. Are we reaching every single family? Um, no, but are we? Um, are those opportunities being made available to them? The answer is yes. Right, and then and, and this strategic plan, it should be culturally, linguistic, competent to reach our community of, of our community uh, student body and parents. And, you know, uh, and that's a maybe a component you need to put in this uh, frame that we're culturally, linguistically confident to do this or we're, we're seeking resources to do this because and, and the, the one thing that we also do um is and I, I appreciate that feedback because if that is missing um it lives directly in it because our office of family and community engagement is directly linked with lucy bollinger and our family of english learner services for example right, right, in, the, right. in, the, in the outreach uh to our newcomers and our english learners as right. well as uh Exp you know, expanding cultural sensitivity and cultural awareness across the district. 
Yes, uh, I was reviewing the each school plan, safety plan, uh, and uh, that's excellent. I think people need to go there on those websites of the schools and see the, the local school district of uh, schools site plans. Uh, we, I think we need a little bit more PR work in that arena. Uh, they're excellent uh, information and, and it tells you, you know, how many positives, how many, uh, and how many people are quarantined. So, you know, people need, we need to um, showboat that, that, that the, the actual school site dashboards and the district dashboards, the county dashboards. And we're working in conjunction with the people with all the stakeholders, you know, federally, statewide, county, and district. And, yeah. and so that's, I really like that, those dashboards, but yet I'm not sure if our community knows that they exist and, and what we're doing at those local levels. And, and maybe these individuals need to go there. I, you know, um, that could be part of the feedback you give them. Please review our, our our community schools plans. Thank also, on now those plans, again, I would like to see the GIS mapping software uh, analysis of the county and our district and, and by site. I know you cannot you know, pinpoint people's houses, but you could do it by zip codes, census tract, in which the county does already and so that you know people could tell what, what's going on in their neighborhood their school site or throughout our district um, other than that again you're doing a great job on that page what wasn't that what page what page yep. are we on? we're on page eight here mr press all right page nine again here's what i say parent advisory teams stakeholders surveys we need to do more of those, a little bit more of those. Latino Madres, I'm glad you're doing outreach, but also uh, there's other people, Asian community. I think they need a lot more support right now. We need to get Asian parents, African-American parents involved with, you know, this. I think you mentioned that last week or the last month's uh, committees, but I'm glad to hear that you're outreaching to uh, English language learners or, and these mothers out there, Latinas mothers, yes. And, and we will take yeah. steps, Mr. Perez. We're going to do blanket, um, for example, our DAC and DLAC, those two committees alone. And if you include um, Superintendent Hoffman's parent advisory, you're talking 125, 130. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll do a an all call to them and these other groups. And, and we will be very consciously aware to make sure that we, we have representation um, we're obviously, it goes without saying, we're a highly diverse school district and we'll take every step we possibly can to ensure that we're hearing from all representatives of all those, uh, all those groups. Uh, and I was going to ask about the timeline and dates of upcoming uh, meetings, but you, you covered that in page uh, 11. But also, uh, I think also, you know, we maybe need a timeline on our page of this COVID and how many times we try to open it up, you know, uh, and because of uh, the, the community spread and, and, and spi spikes that happened in, in that time period, we had, we, we couldn't because people got lax and lax, not wearing masks and, you know, all those events that happened during the, you know, prior, the prior year. So, you know, some type of time frame when we shut down, how many times we, we we try to open, but the spike, just like they have a trend study, you know, and, and maybe uh, that would help the community understand, hey, we, we, we tried to open this up, but people were, did not adhere to the, you know, five golden rules of this epidemic. So uh, uh, here's another issue I, I like to see. Um, I haven't seen in the health component, I haven't seen testing. Uh, I see the plans of, of, the, of, of the, the, the staff of El Grove Unified School District, but nobody's talking about, let's, can, or talk about, can we test these students be, or have them retested before they come back? Uh, what's the difference between 
the athletic football team getting tested and white and, and yards. They brought that subject earlier on tonight, testing of them, or maybe, you know, have them tested just like the football team so they can come back to school and participate in the arts. So okay. why not just do, let's test everybody. You Mr. Know? Chris, mm -hmm. what you want in the planning, because we're talking about the planning right. the process, you would like them to consider testing. Well, yes, that'll be the health component. Okay. That'll be part of the health component. We need a, you know, no, I don't think, you know, uh, that, you know, we talked about the vaccine, but we never really talked about testing. Now we do because we got the football players and the athletic department uh, wanting to come back, and that was one of the conditions of the league. So now, oh, by the way, there's a new uh, report today or just a while ago, that because of all the pressure that the community throughout California that's been put on the state uh, government and, and um, the COVID issue, they are going to open up the doors to, for the arts, band and marching teams and, girl, and uh, cheerleaders and cheer, cheer dancers or whatever they're called, yeah. so things like that. So they, I think they're going to be opening that because of a community pressure throughout California. This, this. Yeah, information, like I said, information from Friday to today. So when right. this information was developed, things are changing and they're changing fast. And, right. and we absolutely understand the interests of the community and mm -hmm. we, we will be able to respond quickly. And there are plans in place to be right. able to respond to that. <laughs> so maybe we need to give a, a workshop how to handle change, <laughs> you know, you know. That's, Amen, Mr. Perez. I, 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 I'm, I. <laughs> that's a big. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Anything else on the process, Mr. Perez? No, thank you. That's it. And uh, keep you. up the work. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Yang. Hey, Beth. Can you hear me? Yeah, thanks, Mark, for uh, the presentation. Um, there's a lot of information in there, um, but I want to uh, touch base on some key point uh, in my mind. So we don't know really what to expect in terms of um, a plan. We have a plan, but uh, we don't know what the result's going to be in terms of effectiveness, effectiveness and safety. Uh, and so forth. Um, so uh, that uh, will be seen. Uh, however, I want to um, I want to um, mention that. Um, well, let me ask you this first: Do we have uh, do we have uh, resources in terms of uh, mental health um, counselor or or assistance? Yes. And so, um, I mean, the short answer to that is yes. And I don't mean to, I'll, I'll wait for a follow-up question. We do, we absolutely do have um, mental health services, our school sites. Um, and again, we have counselors at our, our secondary schools, our elementary schools have our mental health therapists. We have behaviorists, our school psychologists engage in that type of work, social workers as well. So. Um, yes, we do. We do have resources and we contract with uh, Care Solace. So when our, our families are in need of support outside of school, um, we, while we provide mental health services, our services are defined by educationally related is the way we look at that. If it's therapeutics type services, and that's where we, we even have resources where we can guide and support our families in finding those services in the community assisting through whether or not they have health insurance and things of that nature. So we do have services and supports. Okay, and that's throughout um, all grade levels, right? That is correct. It's okay, it's, that's great. So I, I think uh, it's great that we have that resource and uh, I just wanna make sure that we have it. And now that I know that we have it, I think that it's critical to outreach to the parents and the students, to let them know that we have that um, assistance. That's first and foremost. Second, um, 
I think that it's critical for us to have uh, makeup grades for students because we heard from parents and students the fact that um, some students are doing horrible on the distance learning and failing classes. And I think that for the younger ones, um, like uh, elementary or middle school, I think they have time to make up um, somewhat. But I think high school's students are very, very critical because they depend heavily on those uh, grade point average and uh, to, to apply for uh, higher education. So um, I, I hope that uh, you know, we already have that in place in terms of makeup grades um, to, to really help the students that needs uh, makeup grades. So do we have that in place? Well, and so my response to that, Mr. Yang, if it's in just in terms of, of making up grades, if the idea of, of academic support, I'll briefly mention two things. One is on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I can say with confidence and um, that all of our teachers, elementary, middle, and high school, understand the unique nature of, of what we've all been involved in and um, are doing the very best job they can to accommodate without lowering standards and lowering expectations, but understanding that these are very unique times. And so beyond that, um, we, with respect, I heard some comments that were made and, and they were correct that there is significant amount of money coming to the district. We are already engaged in planning it doesn't even really make sense for us to call it summer school because that can have a traditional, you know, if we say, you say summer school, many of us adults are familiar with what summer school was. And um, we are, we have a full team that, that has been pulled together that's analyzing um, and, and we're finalizing, yes, it's another survey, but in terms of what our staff would be interested in doing, what our kids would be interested in receiving, what our parents see as the needs, and we'll be looking at doing that, not just as we typically would, which is predominantly in June. Um, we'll be trying to do that as quickly as we possibly can into the foreseeable future. And it's more than just during the school. We, we could be looking at evenings. We could be looking at small groups. We could be looking at tutoring services that we are providing. And this will be not only this summer, this will be into next year, probably through next year and potentially into the following year. Um, what Mr. Hoffman has, has shared with me directly in one-on-one -on -one meetings and he shared with cabinet um, is that what we want is we want, um, our goal is that um, we get our kids, when we're talking a year from now, that our kids are where they need to be, where they typically would be. And so uh, know that that will be a priority in terms of uh, programming and recommendations for use of those, those funds will be directly supporting what it is that you're referring to, Mr. Yang. Yeah, and that's great, Mark. Um, you know, uh, as a overall, uh, what you mentioned, I just want to make sure that, you know, the students and the parents know that their kids will give, um, will be giving opportunities to make up grades that, is, uh, uh, that they fell on uh, during this pandemic where they are doing uh, distance learning. And I think, um, if we don't do that, then we uh, we don't do justice for these students, um, you know, to to get a better chance to uh, go to higher education in colleges. Because, as I said earlier, they depend heavily on uh, grades, uh, point average, and uh, in particularly high schools. And uh, I think that you know, as far as middle schools goes, uh, the GPA is not that critical. But I think uh, they also need to retake um, the classes that they fail or, or struggle with uh, because they need those fundamental uh, education to build on to go to high school. And the same thing for uh, elementary, right? So, you know, that, that, that is to me is very critical because that is like a build up, right? And if they lose a year or a year and a half and they are failing uh, because of distance learning, they don't get the type of education that they uh, custom to learn, and that's why they're failing and not learning. Then we make we want to make sure that we don't leave them behind because that could really hurt them uh, in the coming uh, years of educations, and that could probably tarnish them uh, for life. Who knows? 
but that's a great chance. So I just want to make sure that that's going to be taken care of because at the end of the day, it's about health. It is about education, right? So to me, those two things are the most critical. If we take care of those two things, um, the rest will kind of fall into places. Um, that that's my opinion. So with that said, um, I I just want to uh, echo um, some of the parents who got on the um, the Zoom and and also uh, some of the parents that ran in. Um, so yes, we. Um, cannot satisfy all the parents' um, demand or everyone's demand, should I say. But, but I think that there's still a lot of concerns out there. So I just want to ask the staff leadership uh, group, uh, starting with Chris, uh, to, to really reconsider what can you guys do, what can we do to, to meet uh, in the middle. Uh, you know, and it's not about pleasing people, but it's to make it work for our community and that's the, our stakeholders, the parents and the students. And uh, quite frankly, they are the most important people, the parents and the students, right? Because without them, we wouldn't have a school. So we got to make sure that they are our priority. So uh, if they are not happy, we got to make sure that we have to, uh, uh, you know, kind of step back and really try to uh, listen and see what we could do uh, better. Because eventually, uh, not eventually, but the reality is, is true uh, th that, um, you know, the parents, students, and, you know, our community um, are our, basically our bosses. Um, you know, and I always say that from day one when I ran for um, this seat, you know, I, I'm not their boss or their boss, they're, you know, the, my constituents are my bosses, right? That's why I have my phone. Uh, available on my campaign uh, information because if they're my bosses and they can't get a hold of me, I think <laughs> that's a problem, you know. So, anyways, um, there's a lot more, but I think that to me that's very critical. So I just want to throw that out there, and uh, I'm sure other trustees uh, has more to ask and uh, comment. So I'll leave it to them. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Ms. Chair Espinoza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of areas I want to explore. Um, the extracurricular, co-curricular, tactical team, is that where we're going to see um, VAPA addressed? Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of comments today on band, and I know that the guidance has been very complicated about which instruments and under which conditions. So is that the tactical team that will address the conditions under which students can engage in, in those activities? Um, I, I would say um, no, and it doesn't mean we're not dealing with it. Um, we don't we don't look at band as a co-curricular activity. It's a it's a full curricular activity and our visual and performing arts. Um, the specific to band, Mr. Murray and Ms. Wilbanks have been working directly, um, monitoring the, as you indicated, um, there's lots of information that is continuing to change. And as recently as, um, and Craig, if I get anything wrong, feel free to jump in, but I'll just say very recently with, within the past several days, we sent, um, a proposal to County Office of Health and they recognized it but didn't they, they couldn't sign off on it in terms of what it was so we are continuing to do that and again Craig is more directly connected with to this um, than I but um, information con continues to change and our interest is if we are able to do it and we've purchased the equipment and it is within the health guidelines, we will do it. That's exactly what we'll do. But um, just to your question that the Cohen extracurricular activities, that isn't right now where that's being addressed because it's being direct, it's being addressed directly in, in, in a, particularly with the band at the secondary level by Mr. Murray, his team in conjunction with Ms. Ms. Wilbanks. Mr. Yeah. Spinoza, just to speak of the, the piece that's here is the planning for the future, but in real time, we're working on the VAPA piece and, um, and our, our VAPA kids um, in, in drama 
in band um, um, and in all the other opportunities. Um, that's ready to ready to go. It worked. It, it's been uh, we pushed hard, and now the the states uh, made made their adjustments as well, and uh, and we're ready to go. So, uh, Mr. Murray, if you want to chime in, but we're not going to wait for this development plan for 21-22. Um, our kids are going to have those opportunities. I mean, immediately might be too soon, but but in the very near future. Yeah. Thanks for that I, clarification, Chris. That's that's important. Yeah. This was. I, I'd just be repeating what Chris had said, and then Craig, you can provide some details. This is not, we are not talking about the middle of July. We are talking about there are, there are going to be some changes in the, the very near future. Yeah, I think, I think that, that just reiterating what, what Chris and Mark said, um, we've got some information that is like, you know, very soon. And then there's always going to be the long-term plans to make sure we can continue to, to adjust and adapt as we need to meet the needs of our kids. We've always been under the idea of of, of engaging our kids in whatever way possible. And so we've got the short-term things ready to go right now. And then there'll be the long-term factors as we continue to evolve and, and, and um, be part of the educational plan development process. Okay, thank you gentlemen, gentlemen for clarifying that we're working to make that happen for our students in the current school year. Um, and I guess my, my question slash comment, Mr. Cerruti is that I just wanted to make sure that those activities curricular or otherwise had a space uh, commensurate with sports, for example, um, in the planning for the future. And with that, uh, I also had a question about the timing of the uh, April 2nd to 9th uh, distance, distance learning interest survey for 21-22. Um, I'm trying to envision how parents are to make an informed choice before asking them what their preference is two and a half months before we describe what those choices really are. Um, so would that April survey give them, for example, a choice of some hypotheticals where we say, um, if the district were to offer um, distance learning through virtual academy or five day a week, um, you know, in person or concurrent instruction, um, how do we actually make sure that that April survey is, is both um, usable, useful information for us and that parents are, are making some kind of an informed choice? It's, it's a great question. I appreciate the opportunity to, to provide needed clarification. I'll start by saying I, we do understand that is um, for many of our, many of our parents and our kids, if they see that there is distance learning as an option, they may be thinking that we're doing distance learning again. Mm -hmm. um, that isn't necessarily the case. The way that the trends are going, and in fact, we just, you know, every every Tuesday morning, Ms. Almatari provides us a, 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 as cabinet, it's shared through our cabinet, the, um, the, the positivity rate, the, the data, and the data continues to trend in the right direction. And so that's what we are, that's what, that's what our goal is. So specific to this, that survey um, is still in development. Um, I'll be, we had a conversation around that in cabinet um, yesterday. We'll be doing it again Monday with the idea of finalizing it. This is preliminary. We need to begin to get a sense of our families who regardless, if we could, if, we're, if we were able to say right now that we are opening up pre-COVID conditions. It's full on, come on back to school, like COVID didn't exist. In there, we have received information from families who have been asking, regardless of that, we have found that distance learning is working for my child. And we want to find out what that, what that landscape begins to look like, because we're, we're looking at basically three types of options. Our Elk Grove Virtual Academy, which currently exists, Las Flores independent study, which exists. And both of those are independent study programs, slight variation between K-8 and the 9-12, um, but they're independent study. The third would be a distance learning version similar to what our students are familiar with, whether that, which is, I'm still connected to my neighborhood school. And so we're, we're working through that so that Parents do understand they are not making a choice in April and committing to anything. This is giving us a thumbnail of, and I'm just making up, totally making up numbers. So please don't, you know, 
folks who are, are still in this meeting. But if, if we had an additional 500 or 1,000 families who were requesting that type of service, now we need to be able to look at, are they centrally located in any individual school where we could offer a fourth grade class and do we have staff to do that? Or is it, we don't do that. What we do is they are still connected to an individual teacher at a school, but we are gathering 24 fourth graders from a variety of, of locations. So this is preliminary in nature and it is absolutely needed for us because we may find out that the data is indicating that we may see an expansion. Maybe there is no, different, no difference whatsoever. Um, I anticipate we may see some variation. And then what we will do is determine based on that, can we in fact provide a type of service where if our numbers are increases at, increasing at either of the virtual academy or Las Flores, our elementary, middle and high school independent study programs, can we accommodate that? And the other is distance learning more similar to what people have experienced, which is I'm connected to a teacher in my classroom. This is not independent study where I connect with a teacher an hour to two to three hours a week. Otherwise I am full on independently learning. Now this is distance learning where I would be with a teacher throughout the school day. And there's another caveat to this. And that is in the end, we may find out that this really we can't offer it because we don't have clear guidance as yet from the state that this is still an option in terms of, can we do that? And how would we deal with attendance and things of that nature? We need to be out in front of it. So we are gonna be asking for some preliminary information to give us a thumbnail of interest on distance learning. I appreciate that clarification, Mr. Suri, that in April, we're not asking students to make a choice for the 21, 22 school year. It no. is. Um, just as it's called an, an interest survey. But again, um, let's just bend over backwards to be as clear as possible, particularly given the frequency with which we are serving our parents. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I want to reiterate that in order for the information to be usable, it has to mirror what the choices may be um, for 21 22 as much as possible. Um, we, we have already seen that um, when given the choice to, to go back in person, albeit concurrent, um, factors like will my child's teacher physically be in the room or will I have access to district transportation were pivotal in, in students and in parents making their decisions. So um, when, when I talk about uh, giving them scenarios to choose from. I mean, some, some factors like that really need to be included, right? Because we know that those are some of the factors that, that um, led to their decisions one way or the other. And, and um, just if I could, one final, final piece. And again, I really appreciate this conversation because hopefully it's, it's deepening everyone's understanding. But again, to reinforce, it's preliminary, but this is only the only people who would complete this. If people are saying, no, I want my kids coming back to school and they still may have questions about transportation. I want my kids coming back and can the district expand transportation? You aren't filling out this survey. This is only, yes, I, regardless of transportation, whether or not schools are open and full, I would like to consider um, a, a, an option for, for distance learning. It is full on the people who are seeing that as the preferred option regardless of what we are doing. So um, we are work, we, we'll be working on that and attempting to communicate it very, very clearly um, why we're doing this and who this applies to. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Mr. Cerruti. That's all for me, Madam Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Chairs. We didn't hear you if you chose the you're next on, person. Yeah. You're on mute, Mr. Fortuna. Thank you, I did not hear my name. Oh. Okay. Um, Mark, you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit because I have uh, both statements and questions, and I have those in a multiple of places. 
Um, first of all, uh, before I begin with uh, comments and questions about the plan, uh, it's important for me to correct something. You know, it's, it's uh, I learned while I was growing up when misstatements are made and the people hearing those choose not to respond, then those statements can be considered true. Uh, there was a statement made two board meetings ago. I made a correction. The statement was made again tonight twice, once by a staff member, once by a board member. And it pertains to going back to school. One of the parents that spoke tonight, Aaron Summers, hit on the areas that I spoke to two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And, that, and this is, simp this is uh, simply stated. One, we could have been in school last October because we were in red. Two, we could have been in school had we chosen to submit a waiver, but we didn't. In three, we chose to make an agreement in October, November, with EGA that said, we'll open if we hit orange. And those three situations kept us out of school. And it's sad because our own data that I spoke to at the last board meeting shows that kids have really been harmed in many, many areas. And that is the truth. Now I will start. I have a number of questions that I will ask. Some questions I will not ask uh, because I'm gonna fold them into two questions I do have. Um, and I had an opportunity to ask uh, many of the, uh, the questions, but let us start with, to me, the most important one. And that's why not one committee? And I had a, and I asked this question and I had a response. One thing that I learned a long time ago is that to survive in this business, one has to have a good memory. I have one. And one has to be organized. And I am. So I went back in my notes and I found many instances of a discussion that I had, but the first one I had was held December, 2014. And in that meeting, I said that as a school district, we need to ensure that all stakeholders are included all the time in develop the development of programs that they are expected to participate in and or implement. That gets back to why not one committee because as the committees are, are uh, designed, one will give input and one will make decisions, write a plan and bring it to the board. And for me personally, it kind of misses the point of inclusion. Now I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh, from my that are you know based on my understanding. And please feel free to correct me if my understanding is wrong. With respect to the volunteers from the superintendent's uh, parent advisory committee that will be on the advisory team. My understanding is that that larger group will choose who those people are. Is that your understanding? No, no. Mr. Porcino, when I, we spoke about that yesterday, the idea was that 
So we'll pick whoever is interested in being from the, those existing committees, but those committees will choose who moves up to the um, the strategic um, team. That, that they'll make that decision about who represents them in the other in the other committee. Okay. So so in fact, then for the memberships from the various uh, constituencies uh, and community groups. Uh, there, there really isn't a limit. This is going to be open-ended. Anyone who wants to be on it. Because one thing that I, I did talk about, and I, I, I just felt that personally, I was a little remiss that they were left out, um, was that there, there were no statements uh, about the inclusion of the Elk Grove Visual Performing Arts Boosters, the Black Youth Leadership Project and the Elk Grove Parent Coalition, which are three groups that have been vocal with respect to advocating their issues. Uh, but my understanding is that uh, since we're gonna have two committees and not one, that any person having an interest in being a member of that committee is welcome there will be no numbers, correct? Well, what we're going to attempt to do, um, and if we had a thousand people that wanted to participate, um, what, we, what we do all the time is um, try and determine what's the best time and the best way for people to meaningfully participate. Um, and so we are going to make every effort to be as inclusive as we possibly can. Um, again, one of the things that, that we have found through distance learning is um, we've had folks who have, have managed um, large meetings with breakout sessions and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. um, our, initial, our initial attempt um, and strategy, Mr. Porcina, is to um, do our best to do an all call and we will go from there in terms of how we can best um, engage all those people who are interested. And will that all call be uh, via all the mechanisms we have available? In other words, email blast, Friday news, individual site notification to parents, so on and so forth. We, we, will, we will make every effort to enable folks to know who are interested, how they can become engaged in the process. Um, I have a question because uh, in the notes that I took when I met with the superintendent, either I didn't ask the specific question to get the question answered or for some reason or other didn't put my answer down. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it down. And that is with respect to the educational model advisory team, how will site administrators and staff be selected for the committee and how will high school student reps be selected for the committee? So we'll do it similarly. What we'll do is um, we will inform uh, Mr. Murray and Dr. Graywall will inform um, our site administrators um, and let them know. Uh, I'll be part of that process to let them know um, what we are doing, why we're doing it, um, and how they can be involved and engaged should they decide to do that. Um, we'll also do, uh, we'll do this same thing with our staff. Um, and then Mr. Murray, we, we already have um, high school rep representatives um, and Mr. Murray, if you have any information of how they were um, selected at the site level, um, but it is my understanding that we do have site reps from our, at the high school level. Yeah, we reached out to principals and had them um, um, provide us with, with uh, student representatives for this work. So the superintendent, so that the principal selected um, who was going to represent the high school. Yes. Because one thing we've talked about often 
is that and and right now i i don't know uh certainly who the students are but one thing we talked about is that quite often uh representatives for various functions come out of leadership teams and leadership teams don't necessarily incorporate a large portion of the student population. And we've talked about different things that we can do to mitigate that so that when we have important uh, work to be done, that we can ensure that we have students that represent uh, a cross section of the student body, and and we don't we don't know who those students are. We don't know if they just came from the leadership team, uh, ASB, or whatever. So we we don't know whether or not, the, in fact, the the students who would participate, in fact, can sit as as a representative of the entire student body. Number one, and number two. And it goes for uh, everyone who's going to uh, be a participant in the committees, and that and that gets to the not what they should do, but what will they what will they do with respect to eliciting uh, data from stakeholder groups so that when they they come to the committee that they're not just representing their beliefs, but they're representing the beliefs of the broader constituency. And and I just think that we we need to to understand that that's that should be an important task. And if if, if you want to share. And you don't need to. Um, in terms of of the the full report that we received, uh, if we believe that kids should be in school five days a week, full day, full complement of activities, why not just say it? It is what we want, and we have we have said that's what we want to do. And that, then the way things are moving, that's 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 where we're going to get. Um, but predicting it um, can't get there. It's still a planned development process, and it's more than five days a week. It's taking care of all the things that will make that happen. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, Ms. Jamerson. Well, I think Mr. Fortina was copying off my notes. He answered, asked several questions that I was interested in. Um, thank you so much for the um, expansion of opportunities for uh, stakeholder involvement for this round of the planning process. Um, and most of my questions do revolve around um, that slide, which I believe is slide nine. Um, thank you for clarifying about the open call so that if, and just to clarify, if a parent um, or community member is not a part of the listed um, constituents groups there, there's still going to be an opportunity when that all call comes out that they can participate. So I just wanted to clarify if that is correct. Yes, that, that is correct. What we're, what we're doing is we, we definitely are, are um, and I don't even wanna say focusing, we have existing groups. Um, and so we wanna tap into those because we, those are folks who are, easily connected, uh, and I wanna be careful because I don't wanna give the impression that we're somehow not um, trying to reach out to others, but those are folks who have been um, directly connected with the work that we're doing, but um, that does not mean that it is isolated to that, to that population. 
And like I said, what we're what we're going to do, um, you know, it's in some ways similar to um, how did we as a district manage um, 1,900 people um, replying to us with um, survey responses and open-ended questions, and what did we do when that 1,900 turned to 31,000? we shifted what we did to accommodate that. And so we'll be looking at um, how we engage um, folks in this, pro in this process moving forward. Ideally, we will find out and be very, very confident that moving forward, we're going to be able to be, you know, as Superintendent Hoffman said, we all wanna be back to quote normal, just better than we were previously. Um, and then, we still will permanently, that's all part of the LCAP process is engaging our school sites. We have individual LCAP processes that conduct needs analysis, data analysis um, in terms of what it is that our priorities should be moving forward. So it's part of what we've always done and part of what we will continue. Perfect. Um, and I know that we have a very aggressive timeline, which you know is needed. Um, I as a, a parent of a B-Track student, July is coming quick and I'm excited to get them ready to go. Um, for the, the March 29th, that's next week. And it says that that's going to be the first week where these um, parent groups, the parent advisory team and the educational model advisory team will begin meeting. So with that being said, do you have an anticipated date of when the all call will go out sometime this week. Yeah, it's the the meetings that will be taking place with that group. I and this is this is the whole the 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 reality of how quickly things are changing is what we are looking at is we will have a an April, a May, and a June meeting that we will be conducting. And so what we're doing and it's because we are timing it so that when that group meets we will have some key data points to analyze. We will have feedback on the concurrent model and we're gonna have feedback on the open-ended question that is being put out to across the district saying, what is it that you, um, what is it that we need in order for next year to be successful? And it's literally going to be open-ended. And we did that because our time is very compressed versus oftentimes our surveys are such that there's a lot of op options to click on and then we always leave an, leave an open-ended option, but this is, this is full on open-ended. And so when we were able to get those developed, get that out because we want that data to be available to the group so that when we're together, we can give a status report and we can say, here's what the health conditions are. Here's what we're now doing as it relates to who knows where we will be with band and some of our VAPA offerings. We may be having kids directly coming onto our campus now. It's what is the current status? What are we hearing? And basing our ongoing conversations around those data sets. So the first meeting of that group is going to be um, middle to the third week of April. Um, and then we will be doing it again in May and then in early June, because like I said, we need to know what our model is going to be by the middle of June. And hopefully and ideally it's sooner than that. Okay. All right. Um, and then, yeah, I think the rest of the questions were answered. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm grateful that uh, the state has aligned with the CDC guidelines and that I'm very optimistic about going back to uh, full-time five day a week in-person instruction. And I can just say that um, having my second grader come home from school and run up the stairs to tell me about how he made a new friend this past week. Um, that's what I'm excited for all of our kids to be able to have that again. So that was, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jamerson. Dr. Martinez Salir. Well, thank you for the presentation. I believe a lot of my colleagues have commented on some of the questions that I had. Um, in regards to the slide, because that's where some of my questions led as well. Um, just if you don't mind, Mr. Saruti, if you could give just the rough estimate of how many people we were looking at for the initial planning process for the 2020-2021 school year, 
are part of those tactical teams. Um, just because we're going to be expanding the committee, and I think it's important to see the work that's been done by the previous committee members and just a rough estimate of how many people were on those committees in initial plannings. A rough estimate of the number of people. So again, the the names, and I would I would contend that that um, the the extended version of that PowerPoint. Um, if anything, it is possible we left a name or two off. Um, but in the end, when we were doing the initial planning, um, it was somewhere between 130 and 150 people. And, and I, and I um, give reference to that because I know as we move forward and we hear updates and reports back from you, once the rest of these teams are developed and more of the stakeholders or holder groups become involved, such as our parents, our student groups, and many of our district teams and committees that are already presented here, um, I'll be looking forward to seeing how much the expansion continues to grow with getting more of that feedback involved. Um, one of the other points, and, I, and I'm very happy about that, um, to hear the feedback and that we'll be reaching out to more groups um, to participate in some of the planning process. I feel it's very vital, um, the feedback and communication. Of course, all of us um, here do, and you've alluded to that, um, the ideas and the feedback and the input is valuable um, for the next planning year. Um, also, I just wanted to make a mention of I know in the past when we've done surveys um, for some of our parents, there was always feedback from some of the stakeholders about just the clarification or the way the questions were asked. So I just wanted to make sure, I know you had tried to earlier, um, I, I believe one of my colleagues, Ms. Chaitis Espinoza had mentioned about that clarity and making sure that we're very specific in answering, asking some of the uh, direct questions. So um, again, I'm, I'm very hopeful that in this next survey go around, Hopefully the question is going to be asked very specific um, in a clear way where our families will understand, you know, um, that, that they're, they're those that want distance learning to make sure that they um, answer in that way. But those that would like to continue on with the full five days a week back model that they, they see that as an option for them. Um, so again, I'll, I'll be looking for that feedback um, for the families. Um, and you know, the work that goes into the planning, again, is not something that's taken lightly. Um, there's many considerations, and I think the presentation tonight has covered all of the considerations that are being offered, but again, um, cannot stress enough the value of the community and the input that we'll be receiving in the future as well. So I'll be looking forward to the reports in the future and the updates of how the planning process is moving. Forward. I know it's a quick timeline and we can't always predict where we're going to be in the upcoming months, but given that the things are looking optimistic now, I, I believe very hopeful um, that fall we'll be able to have that full return that some of the families may are asking for in the comments that were mentioned before. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Martinez Alir. And um President Albiani, if I could just very quickly just make a comment because I do want to um, thank several board members. Um, and it's directly related to what you were just saying, uh, Dr. Martinez Alir, which is um, Mr. Forchina and Ms. Jamerson and Ms. Chavez Espinoza joined myself and uh, a couple of staff members in actually reviewing the next month's worth of surveys and feedback that we were doing. And we had a conversation about um, the focus of the meeting was on the feedback survey we're getting on the concurrent model. And I realized the question could be, why are we doing that? Because um, we need to move beyond it. But it's, yeah, we absolutely hope that we are moving beyond it in its short term, but we do want to get feedback. And so it was nice to have board members directly connected with actually the construct of how we begin to develop these surveys and the prompts that we write. And again, I, I would never say that they're perfect, um, but we, ha we have considerable experience, but the more eyes on them and it was valuable having their perspective on it. And we did spend a little time on this distance learning interest survey and got some valuable feedback that um, we literally applied to it directly after that meeting. So I wanna compliment and thank the board members for participating in that. Thank you, Mr. Shruti. I have um, one 
question. Um, when Mr. Fortuna spoke, he spoke of a large group that, and then the, they will choose to become part of a smaller group. Can you um, clarify what those two are? So, oh, sir, it was my statement or Mark's statement that you were talking to. Um, I, I, I don't care who it is. I'm just clarification. Mark, so, let me just I'll give us that real quick. So the, the idea is if you go to the, go to the, the last organizational chart, I know it shows the organization. I think it's the next slide. So the idea being um, uh, the the new version. What's the? There we go. Uh, oh. So the 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 parents, the people that participate in family and community engagement, or in uh, or in the parent advisory committee, that team will choose which representatives um, work on the. Um, education model advisory team. So, so they'll have, they'll have an answer. You're not going to be able to have all the, all the parents in the parent advisory team aren't all going to be able to serve on the ed model advisory team, but that, that group can choose the people that they want to represent them on the, on that other committee. That's okay. what I was trying to clarify. That's, that helps me. So I just want to, um, I want to say, so I think we've responded to hearing that people felt left out would like to hear and I, and I want to compliment staff for that because that was that was clearly identified and and addressed so thank you um I think having a large parent advisory team will be a great way and I just want to ensure when we move to the educational model team that we are conscious of it being a balanced team that represents every region and when I say region, I mean your high school with its feeder schools. And I think it's important that those people have the information they need to represent their area correctly as we were talking about. So I would hope that, and if they express a need and I don't mean to add work to someone, but just as we're surveying every, every family, every parent, every child will have a chance to say something in a survey. Um, Maybe we train those people to figure out how to listen to their broad school base as um, if they're a one person and we can support them through a school survey done specific for their school. So they just get a better idea of what's, what's happening in and who the, what they're representing to try to hear their voices themselves as well. Or some forum that we help them gather information. I think when you choose um, people that are on the advisory committees currently, I think, ooh, Mr. Fortune, I think you're unmuted. Um, and, and bless you, I think you sneezed. Um, so um, when you choose those people, I have a lot of respect. They've put in a lot of hours and a lot of time and will come with a lot of knowledge that will help that group function well. And so um, I'm excited we're going past that point. And I also want to recognize that you're bringing in people that are conduits into their schools and, and they, have, they, have, they understand our district very well. I think they will serve very well and I'll, I'll appreciate that. And I think it's an exciting opportunity to engage more people um, hopefully it trickles down and they stay engaged and want to be on their site councils and they want to answer their LCAP things. And, and it's just a way for us to take another silver lining out of a large dark storm. Um, I, uh, I appeal to the public to answer the surveys. We have made, like I appointed a board committee to help clarify surveys. And we hope you can see what we are trying to get from them. Um, I want to validate when we talk about coming back five days a week next year is what I am signing my kids up for today. So I'll go on record. That's mine. Vote. You can have them every day. Um, and I, I truly believe that's where we'll be barring another catastrophe, but it's a year where we, I can't write that to you in blood because if we haven't learned anything in the last year, we've learned we can't but we've learned how to work around things and we're in great shape. And so I, I just am excited about the expansions we're able to do. Um, transportation is a true issue. 
and it can't be handled mildly. We are federally mandated. I want people to make sure federal and state mandated to, to transport people. We are always in need of bus drivers. Um, we would hire more if we had more. So if anybody wants to become a bus driver, I was thrilled. We hired three in the last, the last hiring. We have three new bus drivers. So we are continually working for transportation. Um, and I've been asked in numerous emails um, to that. So five day a week, please answer your surveys, our resources. Um, for district, district support of those members to be able to do well, a diverse and a representative educational model. And I believe that is the end of my comments. Thank you very much for this work. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. We will move on to public hearing action items. Number one is the 2020-2021 Memorandum of Understanding between Elk Grove Unified School District and the California School Employees Association and its Elk Grove chapter number 831 in response to COVID-19 coronavirus. Mr. Riley, will you please present the item? Uh, Ms. Albiani, I do think we have one public comment that is in general about all of the, um, uh, about all the MOUs. Ms. Pinkerton, is that correct? The one you're referring to from Mr. Graham? No, there was, I thought there was one that was specific to um, concerns about the, um, the uh, public hearings and the MOUs. Let me double check. Pretty sure there was. Okay, I have on my, um, my order to, for Mr. Riley to present the item and then open a public hearing and ask Ms. Zante if there's comments. Okay, that's why I just want to make sure we didn't read really it. And I will come around to Ms. Sorano and ask Sounds her at that point. Sounds good, thank Mr. you. Mr. Riley? Thank you, President Albiani, members of the board, um, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Avalos. Elk Grove Unified School District and the California School Employees Association and its Elk Grove chapter, chapter 831 CSEA have signed a memorandum of understanding for the 2020-21 school year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The AB 1200 review has been approved by the Sacramento County Office of Education. The EGUSD board is asked to approve or ratify the attached MOU. In addition, Education Code Section 3540.2 stipulates a fiscal review by the Sacramento County Office of Education of negotiated agreements to determine the fiscal, I'm sorry, the financial impact of the agreement on the district budget. Therefore, the AB 1200 report, which provides the financial analysis of the MOU is attached and was submitted to SCOE for their review and approval. As such, I'm asking the Board of Education to conduct a pu public hearing to present the MOU reached through negotiations with CSEA dated January 26, 2021. And with the affirmative action by CSEA to ratify the MOU and the AB 1200 review approval by the Sacramento County Office of Ed, the Board of Education is asked to open a public hearing and receive comments on the MOU, close the public hearing after listening to comments, and then after closing the public hearing, the Board is asked to take action or approve the MOU. Thank you. Ms. Soriano, are there any comments? Okay, hold on. Um, I would like to open the public hearing. Now, Ms. Soriano, are there any public comments related to this item? It does look like there is one that comes up regarding an MOU from a David Singh. That's the one. Okay. Would you like me to read that out? Oh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, Mr. Singh says that, sorry. I'm requesting that the various union MOUs up for approval not be approved as they are not based on current data and guidelines. In addition, they are not legally binding contracts and are preventing our students from fully returning to school. California is dead last when it comes to in-person learning and our social contact with educators has been broken. We are calling on our school board to mandate all K through 12 schools offer full-time in-person education to all students within two weeks. 
where our full time is defined as at least 180 daily minutes for kindergarten, 230 daily minutes for grades one through three, and 240 daily minutes for grades four to 12, or as otherwise outlined in section 43501 of SB 98. Teachers have been vaccinated against COVID-19 ahead of those in their 50s and 60s or with underlying health conditions. Many high, many high need individuals have had to wait months longer while healthy teachers in their 20s and 30s were vaccinated. Our government has provided unprecedented amounts of funding to California schools. AB 86 provided them with $6.6 .6 billion and the recent federal relief bill provided 15.3 billion. In total, with CARES money, schools got $33 billion, or an extra 40% of this year's budget. COVID-19 cases are at exceptional lows with almost all counties out of, the, out of the purple tier. The CDC and CDPH now state with universal masking, students can safely be in the classroom three feet apart. This updated guidance coupled with low case rates allows every school in our district to fully open practically eliminating the need for Zoom in a room. Looking forward to the 2021-2022 school year, EGUSD should be fully open. Those families who may be reluctant to send their children or child back can elect to attend the virtual academy, something EGUSD already offers. Teachers who are still afraid to return can apply to transfer to the virtual academy as there may be an increased need for teachers. It is safe to return to class as millions of other students have done across our county. Please, our kids can't wait any longer. And that concludes the public comment. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to close the public hearing and call for a motion to approve the 2020-2021 Memorandum of Understanding between Elk Grove Unified School District and CSEA. So moved. Second it. Moved by Ms. Karis Espinoza, seconded by Mr. Perez. Do a roll call vote. Mr. Yang? Aye. Thank you. Ms. Charis Espinoza? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Forchino? No. Ms. Jamerson? Aye. Thank you. Ms. Martina Solier? Aye. Mr. Perez. Aye. And myself. It is 6 1 with Mr. Fortino as a no. Item number two 2020 2021 Memorandum of Understanding between Elk Grove Unified School District and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 352, in response to COVID 19 coronavirus. Mr. Riley, would you please present the item? Thank you, President Albiani. The Elk Grove Unified School District and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 352, AFSME, have signed a Memorandum of Understanding for the 2020-21 school year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The AB 1200 review has been approved by the Sacramento County of Education. As such, the EGUS Board is asked to approve or ratify the attached MOU. In addition, uh, Education Code Section 3540.2 stipulates a fiscal review by the Sacramento County Office of Education of negotiated agreements to determine the financial impact of the agreement on the district budget. Therefore, the AB 1200 report, which provides the financial analysis of the MOU, is attached and was submitted to SCOE for their review and approval. As such, I am asking the board to conduct a public hearing to present the MOU reached through negotiations dated February 21, 2021, with affirmative action by ASME to ratify the MOU and the AB 1200 review approval by the Sacramento County Office of Ed. The Board of Education is asked to open a public hearing and receive comments on the MOU, close the public hearing after listening to the comments, and then upon closing the public hearing, the board is asked to take action to approve or ratify the MOU. Thank you. I would like to open the public hearing. Ms. Soriano, are there any comments specific to this item? No, Madam Board President Albiani, there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you. I would like to close the public hearing and call for a motion to approve the 2020-2021 Memorandum of Understanding between Elk Grove Unified School District and the 
American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees Local 352. So moved. So moved by Mr. Perez. Second. Second in by Dr. Martina Salir, a roll call vote. Ms. Charis Espinoza. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Fortino. No. Did you say no? I said no. Thank you. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Mr. Perez. Aye. Mr. Yang. Aye. Thank you, and myself, it is 6-1 with Mr. Fortuna as a no. Item number three, 2020-2021 Memorandum of Understanding between Elk Grove Unified School District and the Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 256, in response to COVID-19 coronavirus. Mr. Riley, would you please present the item? Thank you, President Albiani. The Elk Grove Unified School District and the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 256 have signed a memorandum of understanding for the 2020-21 school year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The AB 1200 review has been approved by the Sacramento County Office of Education. The EGUS board is asked to approve or ratify the attached MOU. In addition, Education Code Section 3540.2 stipulates a fiscal review by the County Office of Education of negotiated agreements to determine the financial impact of the agreement on the district budget. Therefore, the AB 1200 report, which provides the financial analysis of the MOU is attached and was submitted to SCOE for their review and approval. Therefore, I'm asking the Board of Education to conduct a public hearing to present the MOU reached through negotiations dated February 16, 2021 with affirmative action by ATU to ratify the MOU and the AB 1200 review approval by the Sacramento County Office of Ed. The board is asked to one, open a public hearing and receive comments on the MOU, two, close the public hearing after listening to comments. And then upon closing the public hearing, the board is asked to take action to approve the, and ratify the MOU. Thank you. I'd like to open the public hearing. Ms. Soriano, are there any members of the public wishing to speak to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Thank you. And I would like to close the public hearing and call for a motion to approve the 2020-2021 Memorandum of Understanding between Elk Grove Unified School District and the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 256. So move. Moved by Dr. Martina Salir. Thank you. Second by Mr. Perez. A roll call vote. Mr. Fortina. No. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Mr. Perez. Aye. Mr. Yang. Aye. Ms. Chair Espinoza. Aye. And myself. It is a 6 1. Mr. Fortina is a no. Number four, 2020 2021 school year. Meet and confer summary regarding EG teams. EG teams include site and district administration, classified managers, classified administrative support staff, and other, other unrepresented district employees. Mr. Riley, will you please present the item? Thank you again, President Albiani. Elk Grove Unified School District and the site and district administration, classified managers, classified administrative support staff, and other unrepresented District employees have signed a meet and confer summary for the 2020-21 school year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The AB 1200 review has been approved by the County Office of Education. Uh, therefore, the board is asked to approve or ratify the attached meet and confer summary. In addition, Ed Code Section 3540.2 stipulates a fiscal review by the County Office of Ed of agreements to determine the financial impact of the agreement on the district budget. Therefore, the AB 1200 report, which provides the financial analysis of the meet and confer summary, is attached and was submitted to SCOE for their review and approval. Therefore, the Board of Education is asked to conduct a public hearing to present the meet and confer summary reached through the meet and confer process between the district and EG teams dated February 5th, 2021, with affirmative action by EG teams to ratify the meet and confer summary and the AB 1200 review approval by the County Office of Ed. The Board of Education is asked to one, open a public hearing and receive comments on the meet and confer summary, close the public hearing after listening to the comments, and then the board is asked to take action to approve or ratify the meet and confer summary with EG teams. 
Thank you, Mr. Riley. I'd like to open the public hearing. Ms. Soriano, are there any members in the public wishing to speak to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Thank you. I'd like to close this public hearing and call for a motion to approve the 2020-2021 meet and confirm summary regarding EG teams. Roll call vote, Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Hey, Madam Chair, did you we get the motion? A, we need to get a first or a second. Oh, I, I would like to move I just it. kept reading. So Ms. Jamerson is moved. Thank you. May I have a second? I'll second. Seconded by Ms. Chair Espinoza. Thank you, everybody. It is just about now. I start getting a headache. It's 930. <laughs> Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Thank you. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Perez. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Yang. Aye. Ms. Chair Espinoza. Aye. Mr. Forchina. No. And an aye for myself. It is 6-1 with Mr. Forchina as a no. Our next item is an action item. There's a resolution to purchase real property and authorize acceptance of grant deed for Laguna Ridge East Elementary School. Ms. Soriano, are there any members of the public wishing to speak to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no members of the public wishing to speak to this item. Thank you. Um, I would like to then call on Mr. Pierce to present the item. Thank you, Madam President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos. Uh, this is an exciting follow-up item for the board and the community at large regarding the ongoing activities and processes to acquire the district's 43rd elementary school. Dan Marucci is with me tonight, who is legal counsel, has worked very closely with me and my staff during this proper, uh, property acquisition process. Uh, the board will recall that the purchase being considered tonight is pursuant to the authority granted by the board for staff to negotiate the acquisition of this property pursuant to board established parameters. Uh, staff is pleased to have reached terms with the property ownership and to take the significant step in developing the district's 43rd elementary school. Aside from thanking Mr. Marucci, I would also like to thank the board and Superintendent Hoffman for your leadership and direction on this matter. And of course, Susan Bell, Bill Heineke and Kim Williams in the facilities department for all, all the due diligence and work on the project. I would like to also briefly just thank the selling partnership and in particular, uh, Mr. Mark Sanchez, who I work directly with, who represented the ownership group. Uh, these property negotiations were very amicable and I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that. So with that said, I would respectfully request that the board approve resolution number 52, 2020-21, approving the purchase of real property and authorizing acceptance of the grant deed. Madam Chair, I would be thrilled to move this. I'll second it. Okay. That's the first by Ms. Chair Espinoza and the second by Mr. Perez to adopt resolution number 52, approving the purchase of real property and authorizing acceptance of the grant deed, correct? Correct. Um, this will be a roll call vote. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Aye. Mr. Yang. Mr. Yang. Aye. Thank you. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Mr. Fortina. Aye. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. And myself, it's unanimous. I um, unfortunately am gonna call for a four, a five minute comfort break. I do need to go track down some aspirin and some more liquid to drink, please. Um, I will be back. Um,
Steve, you're sharing. Thanks, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, everyone. If we can get everyone back, thank you for that break. Oh my gosh, Mr. Marich, are you here for another item? <laughs> One more. Oh! The next. I'm sorry. Oh no, that's it's quite all right. <laughs> Mr. Yang, Dr. Martina Salir, do we have you? Yes. Mr. Yang, please excuse my eating. I have to get some sugar on my on.
Mr. Yen. All right, we have a quorum. I'm going to keep going. Yes, it's time. And look at that. Mr. Yang's going to appear right now. Number two, series bond 2020-2021 bonds. Consideration of a resolution providing for the issuance and sale of general obligation bonds. Election of 2016 series 2021 of Elk Grove Unified School District in the aggregate principal amount of not to exceed 140,500,000. Here's my teacher. Ms. Serrano, is there any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pierce, would you please present the item? Thank you again, President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos. Uh, you'll have to bear with me here because I have a lot to share with you, but I will do so as briefly as possible. Um, this is obviously a follow-up action item uh, from the bond plan presented by staff and Lori Ranieri of Government Financial Strategy, Strategies excuse me, at your February 23rd uh, school board meeting. Uh, so too, a detailed board communication was previously distributed outlining tonight's actions and the documents that are before you. Of course, with me again tonight is Mr. Dan Marucci of Lozano Smith in his role as bond counsel uh, for this series. Uh, the board will recall with the approval of Measure M, the electorate authorized the issuance and sale of general obligation bonds not to exceed $476 million, consistent with the district's facility master plan and the original bond plan. The district is now in the position to consider the sale of the third series of bonds. In addition to authorizing the sale of the bonds via competitive bid process using the negotiated sale statutes, the resolution tonight uh, sets the maximum amount of bonds that can be issued. As President Albiani mentioned, $140,500,000. The maximum interest rate at which the bonds can be issued, the maximum compensation that an underwriter may earn, and the par amount of the bonds being issued. It requests the county to level the, levy the taxes to pay the debt service on the bonds. It prescribes certain terms and conditions of the bonds, including the payment dates, the method of interest calculation, and the bond redemption procedures. It identifies Lozano Smith as bond counsel and government financial strategies as the financial advisor. The resolution also approves the form of various financing documents and authorizes certain district officials to finalize the documents to complete it to be completed after the sale of the bonds. Part of the resolution package tonight includes the bond purchase agreement. It specifies the terms and conditions under which the underwriter will purchase the bonds. It identifies the purchase price that the district will receive and the debt service that's due on the bonds. It also outlines the documents that are required to close the financing. The documents will be finalized on the day of the bond sale and we anticipate that to occur the week of April 5th, 2021. The large document that you received in your board communication and attached to tonight's packet is the preliminary official statement. It is the offering document containing material information for an investor to make an informed investment decision about the district and the bonds they would be purchasing. The POS is in draft form and the final version of the POS will be distributed to underwriters approximately one week before the sale date. After the sale of the bonds, the terms of the sale will be included in the POS, at which time it will become the final official statement. The resolution before you tonight also authorizes officers of the district to execute the final official statement. One other document tonight is the continuing disclosure certificate. It outlines the district's responsibilities for updating the municipal market and investors with information after the bonds have been issued. Lastly, a detailed reporting outlining the sale results will be provided by Government Financial Strategies at the April 20, 2021 school board meeting. Of course, Ms. Lori Ranieri will be joining me that night. I know you all look forward to that. And I would uh, like to thank the work of countless staff members in the development of all these documents, obviously, as well as Government Financial Strategies 
and Mr. Maruccia for all his work and support through this process. So with that. Mr. And Pierce, just very quickly, you don't thank yourself, but just know um, uh, Mr. Pierce has done a, um, a just an amazing amount of work over the past uh, past several weeks of preparation for this. So uh, make sure you, uh, we uh, understand that as well. I appreciate that, Chris. With that summary, I respectfully ask the board to consider the approval of the resolution and associated documents. And of course, Mr. Marucci and I are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, I'd like to call for a motion to adopt resolution number 54, providing for the issuance of the series 2021 bonds and delivery of related bond and disclosure documents. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Ch Cheris Espinoza, seconded by Mr. Perez. A roll call vote. Mr. Perez. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Mr. Forcina. We didn't hear you, Mr. Forcino. I'm glad I had my computer fixed. Aye. Good. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. And myself, it is unanimous. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank you for your work of yourself and your department, Mr. Pierce. Thanks for being here, Dan. Good evening, and thank you. Appreciate it, Dan. Thank you. Number three, resolutions to eliminate and or reduce classified positions. Ms. Soriano, are there any members of the public wishing to speak to this item? I think Mr. Forcina had his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I was reading. Mr. Forcina? Yes, I just had a comment for Rob. Oh. And that is, don't forget me on the first. Yeah, so yourself, we had we had three board members who wanted to participate. So as soon as we have the agenda and the date, you will all three get an invite. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Sorry, Mr. Fortuna. Thank you, Dr. Martina Salir. Um, number three, Ms. Soriano, are there any members of the public wishing to speak to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no members of the public wishing to speak to this item. All right. So I will call on... Mr. Amrik Singh to present the item. Thank you, uh, Board President uh, Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Aglos. Uh, the board is asked to adopt resolution numbers 48, 49, and 50 for this school year 2021, 2022, authorizing the government, governing board to eliminate and or reduce classified positions in uh, pursuant to education code 45114, 45298, 45308 and 45117. I would like to call for a motion to adopt resolutions number 48, 49, and 50 for the school year 2021 2022, authorizing the governing board to eliminate and or reduce classified positions. So move. Moved by Mr. Forcina. Second. Seconded by Dr. Martina Salir. A roll call vote, Mr. Yang. Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Mr. Forcina. Aye. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Mr. Perez. Aye. And myself, it is unanimous, thank you. Next, we have board member and superintendent reports. So anyone who would like to wish to submit a report on organizational and committee meetings relative to the district. Mr. Forcina. Thank you. Yeah, last week uh, we had another really, really productive and enjoyable two by two with city of Rancho Cordova. Uh, our relationship with Rancho Cordova is stellar. Uh, they provide uh, support wherever they, they can do that for our two schools located within their city. And uh, as always, are uh, highly interested 
and when we will open the middle and high school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending that. Um, Madam Chair. Yes. Not an update, more of a preview. The uh, two by two with our partners at the Community Services District have a meeting. I believe it's later on this week and I wanna welcome Ms. Jamerson to that two by two. So um, look forward to our newly reconstituted uh, two by two with the CSD. Thank you. Dr. martinez Solaire, did you have your hand up? I'll, uh, you're, I'll be next, Mr. Yang. Yes, um, so uh, some of you know I'm um, on the CSBA, California School Board Association, director at large, um, board of directors, uh, serving for American Indian. And I just wanted to give a reminder, I met with some of the committees <laughs> from CSBA, specifically the AEC, which is the annual education conference. And they did put out an email um, blast and hopefully many of you have received it for a call for proposals. So anybody that's interested in presenting, at the next AEC um, conference um, is asked to submit a proposal. It's opening today, March 23rd, and the um, proposals will be open until May 20th. And then the in-person conference will be December um, 2nd through the 4th in San Diego. And they will have a virtual option for those who don't feel comfortable attending in person the conference. And that will be held December 9th through the 10th. So I just wanted to give that reminder. And then also I sit on their board development committee. So I've been working with them and planning different activities for the CSBA board of directors. And I have a meeting this week, with their policy platform committee as well. So I was appointed to three committees for California School Board Association. So as I continue to meet with them, I will be giving regular updates. Thank you. Mr. Yang. I want to share with, um the trustees and um, the leadership here and uh, the public who are still on the call or the meeting with us. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I have a, a Zoom meeting with uh, the Parent Coalition Subcommittee, um, the um, <clears throat> uh, parents who have special needs students. And <clears throat> I learned quite a bit uh, from that uh, meeting with them. Um, it was, uh, pretty um, emotional uh, listening to some of the stories. And I got uh, a, you know better understanding of some of these parents, what they're going through um, with their kids. And um, I would encourage uh, any um, board of trustees to reach out to the parents and listen to their story as well, because it's quite uh, daunting uh, of what they're going through. Um, some of them, uh, have kids who um, who uh, mentally are being um, disturbed, uh, uh, you know, quite a bit because of um, the distance learning, and and it's real. Um, you know, kids out there are hurting, family are hurting, and uh, if uh, you know a group of people came and you know shared those stories, and there are a very small group of people uh, because we have such a big district. I, I think definitely um, the numbers are larger out there in our district. So I just want to share that with the, the board and everyone on this call uh, that, um, you know, that opened up uh, quite a bit of um, some thoughts and some ideas of what's really going on in the district. Uh, it's nothing like hearing from parents, you know, you could predict or, or you know, uh, think about it. But once you hear real story, I think that's just touched touches you and it really touched me deep. So I just want to share with the board. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Um, we'll move on to our next other items from the floor. Mr. Fortina, oh, Mr. Fortina followed by Mr. Perez, followed by Mr. Yang. Thank you. Math, I could be last. You, you'd like to be last? Yeah, please. Okay, that's how I have you. Okay. Hold on, is anybody well, just else? In case somebody, yeah, just in case somebody wanna talk. Okay, Ms. Martinez-Solier, you'd like to talk? Okay. Got it. Mr. Fortuna, please go ahead. Thank you. We have two hours because it's only 10 o'clock. Oh, and, and might as well make the motion. 
I move that we extend for 20 minutes. I love that motion. I'll take it. I may get a second. A second. Second by Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Um, okay. Um, oh, a vote. Mr. Perez. We're voting on whether we'll extend the meeting for 20 minutes past 10 o'clock, Mr. Press. Yes, I know. Okay. That's a popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. jealous. <laughs> yes. Mr. Yeah. Fortuna, Mr. Fortuna, no choking on film. Aye. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Ms. Martina, Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. And Mr. Yang. Aye. And myself, it's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Forcino. Thank you. Um, on March 6th, I forwarded uh, a memo uh, to Ms. Albiani, Mr. Hoffman, asking that it be shared with the entire board and uh, with the public. And the reason I did that was so I would not be in violation of Brown Act submitting it to board members on my own. And in that memo, what I addressed were some of the items that I had addressed the previous week, week with the hope that as a board of education, we can open up a dialogue on a number of issues, a number of which will have uh, a relationship with our budget development process. The first item that I had indicated I would like to, to have full uh, dialogue on is one of the subjects we talked about tonight, and that is the full reopening five days a week of our school district beginning in July. The second thing I indicated we need to, to pay attention to and we need to address is how we are going to provide interventions to impacted schools so that we don't have to deal with the same issue year in and year out. And associated with that also is to get specific information from parents delineating the specific reason supporting their request for open enrollment. Without detailed information, once again, we don't know what measures to take to mitigate issues at a particular school. And certainly an example would be more challenging program. What does more challenging program mean? Um, if we don't make the effort to find out specifically what parents mean when they make that kind of a comment, then we can't address what needs to occur at a school site so that uh, hopefully uh, the, the parents in, in preceding years won't feel the need to uh, leave their home school. The other thing, and this is probably the most important thing, uh, we need to establish deliberate systems of support and intervention with specific considerations for, that are detailed for specific subgroups for the purpose, of, the purpose of equity and improved student outcomes. We have an office of equity because we believed in the value of increasing people's awareness about differences, about racism, about hatred, and so many other areas. And yet, we get reports year in and year out that say the same things. When it comes to black kids, brown kids, homeless kids, special ed kids, foster kids. And it's time that, from my perspective, that we, as a school district, quit talking about needing to 
address the outcomes for specific student populations and do something about it. And that doing something about it means the establishment of specific programs targeted to certain groups for specific reasons. And then most importantly, to provide the funding so that they can occur. And I believe we need to talk about that. We need to talk about ensuring stable funding for social workers. The social worker grant will be expiring. As our students return to school in 21, 22, that's gonna leave a big hole. To have them back for another year under temporary funding doesn't address the needs that the school sites, the parents and everybody on this board has addressed. And that is the need for social workers. One of the things I had listed and I'm happy to say we're gonna do it. And that is having a board workshop. We need to talk about attendance boundaries. Again, uh, if we don't address attend attendance boundaries, we have the issues of school impaction. We have the issues of, of uh, some schools being very light with respect to the number of students they have uh, in their schools. And when you have fewer students, you have fewer opportunities. I would like us to take a serious look at doing one of the things that is a hallmark of good boards of education, and that's having a yearly board evaluation. One of the things that will be coming, but I thought it was very important for accountability, for transparency, is an accounting of the CARES Act money. What did we do with it and what do we get for it? I believe we need to take a serious look at the expansion of the equity office for the purpose of increasing student outcomes. The current program specialist has done a stellar job of advancing the principles that we all believe in. And he is limited by the fact that he is one. And lastly, I believe we need to have a serious talk about reviewing and standardizing classified and certificated ratios of all of our schools regarding, regarding, regardless of their funding source. Now, a number of these items have been discussed in years past. We've talked about the need to have board workshops where we actually address topics that need to be addressed as opposed to receiving data and reacting to it. Um, there's a lot that we need to, to address. These are my thoughts. I know each one of you have your own thoughts. Nancy has talked about immersion. Tony has talked about parent education along with other items. Everyone's talked about things and then they've talked about them and then they've talked about them and then they've talked about them just like me. We need to, we need to take the time as, as board members to take a serious look at some of the areas that we need to change and improve, decide what and how we're gonna, we're gonna do it provide the funding sources, even if that means we stop doing some things that uh, perhaps don't give us the outcomes we want and move forward. And 
Uh, I hope each one of you will get a copy of this so that you have it before you as we sit down and, and begin uh, budget deliberations. But in addition to those budget deliberations, I think we need to sit down as a board and take a look at where each of us believe that we need to uh, take action. And then we can decide what we're gonna do because we, we certainly aren't gonna be able to do it all and then move forward. And that would be a wonderful place to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fortuna. I have your list and I did not understand you wanted it formatted. I'm in the process of gathering similar lists and requested them from people <laughs> on the board for that board, board meeting, just so you know. Thank uh, you. Next on my list, Mr. Perez wanted to speak. Oh, shoot. Hey, I agree 100%, Mr. Forcino. And um, yeah, I think it's very important that we, we analyze where the first pot of money and CARES went to. Our second pot of money is coming right now. And we need to uh, prioritize what we want to do with that money. And so as a result of that, and the change of administration, I think, and Mr. Cordova, number one in DC or for the feds, I think we're gonna have a lot of funding coming down streams from the feds. So we need to prioritize and do assessment of, of our community schools throughout our district. And do, Again, I will just say we need to do a statue analysis, geography, geography, GIS, and all that, and and outcomes. It, it's it's being used right now. So uh, I'm I'm happy that you said that, Mr. Porcina, and uh, I'm willing I'm willing to meet tomorrow. <laughs> you know, a long time has gone by that. And also, it's, it's, it's good for the, the new board members. They're new and, 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 and work as a team to, to prioritize and focus and see their vision. It's most likely like ours. And um, set these timetables. Um, just recently, again, there's another pot of money at the state level. <laughs> what are they going to do with that? And so, uh, so we need to, uh, you know, spend some time downtown at the Capitol. Say, hey, listen, we need it here and there. Um, you know, it's it's time that you know, you know, let's talk about uh, this new uh, preschool or pre-K objective or plan. You know, we need those. I first, I was thinking that since that last meeting. I think we need them at every elementary school. We could help every working parent, you know, with child care, early child care, and you know, at every school. And so if, maybe we ought to think, rethink the, your concept that you have for the Franklin community out there, you know. But I personally think that every school should have a pre a pre K setting. Like, um, here's an example. Mr. Perez? What? Um, Mr. Fortuna went down a list of ideas he had, and I have not had a chance to reach out to the entire board, though I've reached out to some of them. We do have the meeting scheduled on April 16th and 17th, Mr. Hoffman, is it? The two evenings to do this exact kind of work. That's what that is for. And, and if um, I can just say, please, start thinking about and making a list and I will be requesting or Mr. Hoffman will be requesting that we can pool our ideas together and yours would definitely include preschool. I know that is a passion of yours, Mr. Oh, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shout, do another shout out for, for a full comprehensive services to our students. Yes, they have mental health issues. They also have issues, dental, eye and primary care services. 
And so again, I'm going to stress that I like to see maybe a roving uh, primary care clinic on the wheels that circulates throughout our district and provides services to our students in need. Uh, or, or work in partnership with Kaisers and, and the local hospitals and community clinics throughout this yeah. area. The last thing I want to say is that I'm not very happy what the county is doing in these high concentration of COVID outreach and doing uh, equity services. Their criteria was just very similar. It didn't go to the community from you know pre uh, pre K to sixty five. The only thing they did different they would service 65 and elderly over and provide vaccines. They have, that's all they're planning to do in, my, in Valley High School region, Florin High School region. And, and, and again, I looked at the outcomes of different uh, census tracts and area zip codes. We still have high incidence in, in geographical areas and they, and we, need to partner with them and tell them that, hey, we need uh, education, COVID outreach education to these communities. And, and if, it, if it's a language barrier, we need to do that. But anyway, um, also the other thing, I still support, support testing of our students before they come back, before they step on campus, because everybody will feel comfortable coming to campus and, and that, if, if there's an outbreak that's easier to trace and uh, blah, 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 the whole works. And we, we need to spend that some type of monies on testing of students more. You know, we, like again, you know, we, why, 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 why not? We're doing it to the football team. We, you know, we need to do it with everybody. And so we think we need to think about that issue so we could start school next month when, when everybody gets tested and they're negative. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Dr. martinez Salir. So I just had um, some information I wanted to share and a potential idea. Um, hearing the comments, I am looking forward to the future board workshops and different ideas that are being brought forth, of course, to discuss some budget. Um, one of the things or information I wanted to share is that um, some of you know I um, work for a local community college and um, have worked at the CSU and UC levels prior to that. And one of the things that the higher education campuses have done is that they have adopted a formal land statement to recognize the indigenous peoples and native peoples and that their institutions currently serve on indigenous or native homelands. And so um, one of my involvements at the college um, being that I work specifically with the native students and being from the native community and a Miwok member, um, I worked with the local tribal government to develop a land statement which recognizes the native homelands that many of our school sites and higher education sit on. And so I just wanted to bring forth the idea of the potential that maybe our district in the future may be able to adopt a similar statement and work with the local tribal government to create that and to give the recognition um, and just basic, basically appreciate and acknowledge the native tribes that are in this region here um, within Elk Grove, but also all throughout the state of California, many CSUs and UCs as well as community colleges have adopted that statement. So I just wanted to bring that idea forth um, just to see if that's something that we may be interested in doing. And the statement doesn't have to be very lengthy. I've seen them from a paragraph, there's models out there ranging to a few sentences. But I just thought moving forward um, in, in this time um, that we might be able to bring forth something like that. So I just wanted to mention that. That's great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hoffman, did you want to speak before Mr. Yang closed out our meeting? I'm sorry, I did neglect to call on you. Um, I'm actually okay. Uh, the, um, uh, as Mr. Yang can uh, close it out. Okay. Thank I'm still you. waiting, by the way. Oh, I don't know how I didn't write you down. Thank you. My apologies, Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Sure. At first, um, I want to uh, associate myself with Dr. Martinez O'Leary's comments. I, I would absolutely support a Native land acknowledgement and uh, please um, 
consider me a, a, a team member, happy to help in, in any way I can, development of that, and hopefully we can agendize that and bring it bring back, I guess, some options, some ways to do that to the board. I'd, I'd love to do that. Um, I also want to associate myself with um, several of the points that Mr. Forchina made. Um, and I may phrase them differently, but I think we have some similar interests. So I, I do think it's time to revisit attendance boundaries. You know, there are uh, a handful of schools in our district that consistently are those um, that are oversubscribed and some of them are in my area and some are not. Um, but, you know, we have been doing some great work with establishing caps with um, you know, marketing to promote the strengths that are apparently less known about some of our other schools. Um, but part of the solution is a revisiting of attendance boundaries. And I realize that it's, uh, it's a process that creates perceived winners and losers, and that I will probably regret <laughs> bringing this down on us, um, but it is, it is a fairness and equity issue. So I do, I do support bringing that back. Um, Ongoing funding for social workers uh, is also really important. Um, our, our kids have collectively been through a pandemic. Many of them have experienced racial trauma in the past year, in addition to everything they were going through um, before the pandemic. And our district was put in the untenable situation of actually having to hire a couple of years ago, um, social workers and other mental health uh, personnel with one-time funds. And so we had to hire those folks and um, it's just critical that we at least be able to hold on to what we had before and, and in reality um, expand on those resources because our kids need them now more than ever. You muted yourself, Ms. Chairs. Thank you. And now more than ever is the last words that, came out, that we okay. heard. Yeah, social workers, we need them yes. now more than ever. Yes. Um, I also want to speak to Mr. Fortuna's point about the fact that we need more targeted and more specific outreach strategies to help our LCAP subgroups. Um, you know, again, I, I just I feel like we've been tinkering around the edges with our LCAPs in the last few years and setting goals that are too modest and um, just really need to, um, I guess, cast a wider net. For, for very targeted intervention strategies. You know, a year or two ago, we had a group of black mothers who was pointing out to us uh, the overall district, but also the, uh, the specific um, testing scores in math in particular for black youth. And, you know, we haven't really had a response to that, right? The overall numbers are something to be concerned about, but the, the percentages specifically within some of those targeted groups like the black children they were talking about are incredibly concerning. Um, and I just, I think it's time that we be brave enough, frankly, to really think about some targeted strategies for, for some of those groups with higher needs. Um, I think Mr. Fortuna mentioned disproportionality. Uh, I, I really want to couch this in terms of student discipline reform. Um, and, and I brought some of this up before. So talking about um, in-class suspension, right? So we are no longer suspending as much as we did. Those numbers have come way down. Um, expulsions, our criteria are pretty tight. They're narrowly defined here in the district. Um, but in terms of disproportionality, I, I look forward to that coming back to the board. We've got a couple of members who, um, of course, would, uh, I think, benefit from hearing what we have done. But we, really, we would all benefit from um, seeing what, if any, effect the changes we have made, like the, the board policies we put into place a few years ago, what changes, um, what effects have we seen, if any, to those? And, and if not, what else do we need to do to, to tweak those? So I, I'd be interested in um, revisiting disproportionality and also um, making sure that we are being as constructive as possible with all of our student discipline policies, right? So instead of you know, warehousing kids and in-class suspension, um, how do we you know, put a social worker or some other person in that room to actually determine what is the root cause of that behavior? How do we, um, how do we make better use of that time for everyone um, and, and actually provide some resources to kids in need. 
Um, and last thing I'll talk about is I'm very much interested in uh, what our timeline can be to opening five days a week. I know that we as a board have made our decision about the remainder of this year, but we did make that before the guidance changed on the three foot, um, you know, six foot to three foot. So, um, I mean, I, I really would appreciate uh, a discussion about what it would take to change uh, even for the remainder of this year, if it's a possibility. And, and I say this knowing that um, we're asking a tremendous amount of our school staff, of our educators with the frequency of the changes that we are a tremendously large organization. Um, but I think we do owe it to the public to at least think that through um, in, a, in a public manner so that they can see that we've given it um, fair consideration, and if it's at all possible to do, um, to do that, even if it means we're doing it for a month at the end of the year. Um, you know, I know we all keep up with what our neighboring districts are doing. Um, Natomas Unified here in Sacramento County has been able to kind of turn on a dime and go to five days a week, so that, of course, makes me wonder, um, you know, what are they doing that we're not? So I just, uh, whether that comes back to us I was going to say in the form of a BC, but I really think we need to, to have that discussion publicly for the benefit of the board. So uh, I guess, Madam Chair, I would, I would ask that you look to agendize that going forward, just because whether it lead to a board decision or not, we need to address that more clearly for the public. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, so Ms. Chair, Espinoza has asked to have something put on the agenda to review the factors um, involving five days a week. Would that be a, a fair statement? Um, you're on mute still. The prospect of doing that in the current school year. Prospect. Um, we have a motion. Do I have a second? I second. Okay, thank you for Ms. Jimerson. A second. Um, all in favor? Mr. Is, um, Mr. Press? I'll second it. How about you vote on it, yes or no? <laughs> I, I, well, what I was thinking, I, I'm sucking Mr. Procino's motion. <laughs> and I, and no, 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 Kara's made an, a request to put something on an agenda. Ms. Jamerson what? seconded it. Ms. Cheris made a request to put something on an agenda. Well, I Jamerson thought, has I was seconded it. The same thing. And now I'm asking you if you would agree or disagree with her motion. I just had a point of order that I thought uh, Mr. Forsina had a motion to have of that agendize, but you didn't bring that up to the group. He didn't make a motion. He never made a motion. I have a motion and a we second on the floor. I'm asking for your vote, Mr. Perez. Would you consider making that a motion, Mr. Forcina? It doesn't matter, Mr. Perez. We have a motion on the floor, and this is what we need to deal with till this is finished. Would you like to vote on the motion? A yes or a no, sir? Yes. Tony, I, Thank you. Mr. Forcina, no, would you like yes. to vote yes or no? Uh, well, yeah, I, 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 I certainly do. I tried to get that yes vote in two previous board meetings. So I uh, definitely am a yes. Yes or no works. Thank you. Ms. Jamerson. Aye. Thank you. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Yang. Aye. And Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. And myself. So. We will agendize that in the future. Now, um, I need a motion to extend the meeting by 10 minutes. Does that seem like enough time, Mr. Yang? Yes. Okay. I move, I move uh, extending the meeting for uh, 15 minutes. All right. Um, Mr. Yang is asked to speak last. So if we can respect that as a group, please. Um, I need a second. I second that. Thank you. Mr. Perez, to extend the meeting, a yes or no, please. And then. Yeah. Great. And then can you mute, please? Mr. Forchina? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Jamerson? Yes. 
Ms. Chairis Espinoza? Yes. Mr. Yang? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Martina Salir. Aye, yes. Thank you. Mr. Yang, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Beth. Can you hear me okay? I wanna start by saying, stop the hate. Stop the Asian hate. From March, 2020, to February 2021, there has been Asian incidents that relate to crimes and assault. And the cases are 3,795. That includes verbal harassment, physical assaults, civic rights violations, and online harassment. And those are including verbal harassment, such as talking down on the color of certain people's skin or the way their eyes shape to the point where physical assaults that a knife was used to cut an Asian man's face from right to left on his face. Elderly Asians getting beat up and attacked in the middle of the day in the streets. And last week, the horrified shooting that occurred in Atlanta that took place in Asian businesses and tragically took eight lives and six of the eight of those six of those eight lives were Asian. We have not got the motive of what really drove this shooter, but in everybody's mind, especially Asians, it's a hate crime. It's a hate crime. Attack on Asians, attack on Blacks, attack on whites, Indians, Latinos, is an attack on all of us because we are one American community. So I strongly recommend for us as a board, as a community, um, to stand in solidarity with our Asian communities. Asian brothers, sisters, parents, kids, locally here in Elk Grove, statewide and nationwide. We as board of trustees, we need to condemn anti-Asian hate crimes by commit to combating Islamophobic, racism, bigotry, and discrimination by providing statements or resolution, but better yet, enhancing the programs that we have to educate students, parents, community, so that in result, we will have better understanding or better at cultural competency, culture sensitivity, and hopefully will reduce hate crimes in general, and particularly Asian, anti-Asian hate crime because of this pandemic that started from China Asian are being blamed for it. Asian American and Pacific Islanders are being blamed for it. And we have to be a part of solution by stopping these anti-Asian hate crimes. Thank you. To, to include ethnic studies 
in our district. That's just been approved by the Board of Education and they say that that does resolve hate crime, bullying, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the solutions that we could do. So is that a motion or a resolution or what? Mr. Perez, Mr. Yang asked to speak last and I, I think he wanted to make that statement. Yeah, he did. And, and close with it. Well, I well, believe that, I believe that we are working in the background in providing statements and also working on enhancing our programs. Um, and I am uh, honored to be a part of that subcommittee. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of, of subcommittee. So um, Mr. Perez, thank you for your support. I appreciate it. And if you want the resolution, I support you on the resolution also. Thank you. And um, I feel confident I'm speaking for the board that we are in support with you, Mr. Yang. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd like to adjourn tonight. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Kaufman. Thank you. Have a good night. You're welcome, sir. We'll get we'll get it done. Close at 1029. Yeah. Thank you. Adjourn. Be well, everyone. <laughs>